Hello. And a very good evening from the De Beers Society to Oxfordians and Shakespeare lovers everywhere. I'm Kevin Gilvary, and it's my honour as president to introduce The Food of Love, a splendid programme of music and poetry in which we celebrate Edward de Vere and the music in his plays. Our programme tonight will entertain and enhance our appreciation of the greatest works of literature. I know that many of you, like me, have enjoyed the wonderful music accompaniments at theatres across the world, such as Shakespeare's Globe in London, where Claire Van Campen did such a great job, to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashland. Now, we all know there are many, many references to music in the works of Shakespeare, over 500 in all, but not all of us are aware that Edward de Vere himself was celebrated in his lifetime as a talented musician. He also patronised his own troupe of musicians. Indeed, many of de Vere's known poems were probably composed originally as songs. So in the first half of our programme, we'll be hearing about Oxford Shakespeare music from experts such as William Lyons. We'll also hear distinguished actors such as our founder, Charles Beauclerc, Hank Whittemore standing by in New York, Annabel Levenden, Richard Clifford and Sir Derek Jacobi. They will recite passages of interest from the plays and the poems. And finally, we have musicians ready to perform solely for our delight. The Society of Strange and Ancient Instruments will form parts of, of William Kemp's popular jig. Now, the second half of the programme comprises a delightful concert of music. It lasts an hour and it will begin promptly at seven o'clock British time. Amarilli will enchant us back across space and time, recreating the sounds and songs of the early modern period. And really consists of the celebrated lutenist Elizabeth Pallet and the vocalist Hannah Grove. Now I'm speaking to you from Hampshire on the sunny-ish south coast of England and I'd be very grateful if you could just go down to the chat button and introduce yourselves and say where in the world you are. I expect you know about the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen as well. You can put questions to the panelists and we will try to address these points during the show or after on the website. Well, that's enough introduction for me because if music be the food of love, play on. That was a contemporary arrangement for keyboard of a song by William Byrd, first published in 1588. My mind to me a kingdom is, and many Oxfordians will know, that is based on Oxford's famous poem of that title. I'm going to be talking a little more about it and explaining how Byrd's music connects very precisely to the poem and how it amplifies the inner meanings of that poem. But first I would like to thank very much Kevin Gilvary for his warm introduction and to introduce Hank Whittemore, who's going to read us some famous lines from Shakespeare. Thank you, Hank. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. That that strain again, it, it had a, a dying fall, or it came o'er my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and 
giving odor. Enough, no more. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. Oh, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, that notwithstanding thy capacities receiveth as the sea, naught enters there of what validity and pitch so wear, but falls into abatement and low price, even in a minute. So full of shapes is fancy that it alone is high fantastical. Thank you, Hank, very much indeed for that. I wasn't sure whether someone was going to introduce me, but I've got a feeling uh, I'm just here on my own and going for it. And I want to talk about uh, three uh, poems and their relation to Edward Vere and his relation to music. I don't think that it's anyone present at the moment is unaware uh, that Edward de Vere was a fantastical poet, uh, very much admired in his day, playwright, and a generous sponsor of scholarship, music, and literature. He was a child prodigy whose infancy, I'm quoting from Arthur Golding, whose infancy from the beginning was ever sacred to the muses. And as a young man was a favorite of Queen Elizabeth who reveled in his lively dancing and commended him to foreign potentates, not in the usual way, I'm quoting from Elizabeth here, not in the usual way, but from my heart on account of his outstanding intellect and virtue. He was the youngest man of his generation to be honored by both Oxford and Cambridge universities and his deep knowledge of ancient history, geography, foreign languages, astronomy, and music is praised by many of his contemporaries. In 1584, the poet John Soutern, I think possibly coming from the French word Soutern, I'm not sure, trumpeted his silver pen, I quote, and art for which Soutern insists he deserves eternal fame. For who marketh better than he, Sutern writes, the seven turning flames of the sky, or hath read more of the antique, hath greater knowledge in the tongues, or understands sooner the sounds of the learner to love music. Vier was remembered by the composer John Farmer for his, I quote, great affection and judgment in music, and Farmer elsewhere wrote to him, stating, for without flattery be it spoke, those that know your lordship know this, that using this science, i.e. music, as a recreation, your lordship hath overgone most of them that make it a profession. It is not known which musical instruments Vere played, but lute, recorder, and virginals are all very likely. Shakespeare displays intimate technical knowledge of the sound and workings of each of these instruments in his plays and poems. Vere chose his servants from among those who could play, sing, act, write poetry, or compose music, um, very like a, a, a character in a play by Richard Broom, who boasts how all his servants, uh, however good they are at laying the table, they're also uh, wonderful at playing on the viol or the oboe. Uh, Vere had, uh, for instance, the actor playwrights John Lilly and Anthony Mundy on his staff. Henry Locke, a poet servant, who worked for Vere for over 20 years, revealed how all of his servants, and I quote, tasted of his liberality by gift or procurement of land, lease, or permanent gift of his own estates by his procurement or in clothes and money. Remember that Vere was fantastically generous. We know that the most successful composer of his day, William Byrd, received from Vere the lease on Battles Hall in Essex, and that the great lutenist Robert Hales received an annuity of 20 pounds out of, quote, the issues and profits of his lands, tenements, and hereditaments in Essex. Bird wrote the Earl of Oxford's March, also known as March Before the Battle, and I wonder sometimes whether there's any little joke going on there concerning Battles Hall. In April 1576, Vere brought back with him from Venice a brilliant young chorister whom he had heard singing at the Church of Santa Marina in order that he might sing before the Queen and the court at Westminster. So clearly he was very transported when he heard this boy singing in Italy. Now, if I may, I should like to read Vere's earliest statement on music, three verses from a poem of four written before he was 17 years old as a song lyric called In Commendation of Music. 
you may recognize the first three lines because they are quoted in Act 4, Scene 5 of Romeo and Juliet, prompting a comic conversation between three musicians bearing names associated with musical instruments, James Soundpost, Simon Catling, and Hugh Rebeck. A Rebeck is an early form of violin, Catling, a lute string, and Soundpost, a peg connecting the inside front and back of a stringed instrument. So here's the poem, or the three verses of it, I'm going to read you. When griping griefs the heart would wound and doleful dumps the mind oppress, their music with her silver sound is wont with speed to give redress of troubled mind, for every sore sweet music hath a salve therefore. In joy it makes our mirth abound, in grief it cheers our heavy sprites, the careful head released hath found by music's pleasant sweet delights, our senses that should I say more are subject unto music's law. A heavenly gift that turns the mind, like as the stern doth rule the ship, O music whom the gods assigned to comfort man, whom cares would nip. Sith thou both man and beast doth move, what wise man then will thee reprove? Now, I've heard an awful lot of tripe spoken about the rottenness of Edward de Vere's verses written when he was 15 or 16, but I would be very proud and excited if my son or myself or any, anyone else I knew could write a poem as, as pretty and delightful as that as a teenager. Now, that poem, just for your interest, was wrongly ascribed to uh, Master Edwards in the 1576 edition of Paradise of Dainty Devices. That went through a number of editions, and they cleared up a lot of the mistakes in ascription. So Edwards' name was removed from all eight editions that followed between 1578 and 1606. And we know that that poem was by Edward de Vere, not just because those of us who know enough about his poems can hear very clearly uh, the uh, unique ring of his voice in the poem, but because there is a manuscript copy of that poem which is subscribed Ball, and Ball was a poesy type of pseudonym used by Veer. And we know that because there are other manuscripts signed Ball, uh, three of them in fact, which have also contemporary manuscripts telling us that those poems are by Oxford. If Fortune May Enforce, uh, which is in the Coningsby Harleian collection, uh, Who Taught Thee First to Sigh, which also has a manuscript uh, written Earl of Oxford underneath it, in Finnett's Miscellany, and My Mind to Me, A Kingdom Is, in the Harvard folio, uh, is ascribed to Veer and elsewhere to Ball. So we have three different witnesses that the Ball poems are in fact Edward de Vere's. Now, I have no real idea why he signed himself Ball, and if anyone does have ideas, I'd be very grateful to hear from you, and you can write comments about it. Could it be to do with the O of Oxford is like a ball? I don't know. Could it be something to do with rings who knows, but your ideas would be uh, greatly welcomed. Moving on, My Mind to Me a Kingdom is, so that's one of the ball poems that is also ascribed to Veer in an early, uh, to Veer in an early manuscript. It's often thought to be uh, a sort of almost a joke poem, um, a light poem about a man who's got a lofty mind who thinks he's above worldly cares. It begins, My Mind to Me a Kingdom is, such a perfect joy therein I find that it excels all other bliss, that world affords or grows by kind, though much I want, which most would have, yet still my mind forbids to crave. I won't read the whole poem to you, because I think so many of you know it already, and anyway, it's going to be sung for you later on. But the point of that poem, and I played it on the piano uh, just a moment ago, uh, the point of it really is that it's actually a deeply uh, religious poem. Um, he is taking his ideas from Matthew 6.33, where Jesus says, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth, don't worry about food and drink and clothes, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. How do you seek the kingdom of God? Where do you seek it? Well, you only have to turn to Luke 17, obviously an important number for Edward de Vere, and Jesus says, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, look here or look there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That's what this poem is about. And of course, it draws heavily as well from Hermes Trismegistus. And there's a lot of very exciting Oxfordian research being done at the moment, showing these links between uh, hermetic thought, Hermes, and uh, Shakespeare. And Hermes Trismegistus uh, says, he writes, God shows himself freely to all, not where, as in place, or how, as through some quality, or how much, 
as in quantity, but by illuminating people with the understanding that comes only through mind. There is nothing more godlike than mind. So you can see where he's coming from. Now, this is a um, conference about music. So back to music, William Byrd wrote that piece and William Byrd fully understands that this poem is about the kingdom of God and about the connection of the poet's mind to God. Um, we know this because just as in, in poems, there's a lot of uh, numeric symbolism goes on, so does it in music of this age. And this song, My Mind to Me, A Kingdom Is, is entirely built around the number of divine perfection, that is the number three. Each measure contains three whole notes, or semi-breves as we now call them, they were known as whole notes then, and there are in all 27 measures, which is three times three times three, three cubes. And the melodic content is constructed of layered thematic motives of three notes each, which are repeated three times to form a set three times three, while sets themselves are grouped into threes bringing us back to this three times three times three represented by the 27 measures and the three triangles of the sonnet's dedication. I haven't time to tell you now, but if we have a question and answer, I'll, I'll point it out that Veer himself in the poem is using numbers in an extraordinary way. Um, he has each verse contain 48 uh, syllables and uh, there are 48 lines and that has meaning as the relation of Veer to God. But three is what um, Bird is playing on in line with these sayings that we hear so much in those days, tria sunt omnia, threes are all, or as James says in his epistle, tres testimonium dant, uh, threes give testimony, or omne trinum perfectum est, all uh, things in threes are perfect. So finally, to a poem written later in life that praises the combination of music and poetry, comparing it to his friendship with R.L., one R.L., which... William Covell in Polymantia of 1595 cryptically reveals to be none other than that rose lily, Rosalie Henry Thurdell of Southampton. We are very honoured to have our revered patron, Derek Jacobi, to read it for us in just a moment. First, if I may, a few quick remarks about it. The sonnet was first published in The Passionate Pilgrim as by William Shakespeare. We know not when, as there is no extant title page on the unique first edition copy, but probably around 1596, 1597. After that, it reappeared in the two subsequent editions of Passionate Pilgrim in 1599 and 1612, as well as among a group of Shakespeare-related poems in a 1598 pamphlet called Poems in Diverse Humours, possibly a pun, I think it probably was a pun, Poems in De Vere's Humours with an implied ascription to Richard Barnfield. Now, in the Barnfield edition, the poem is entitled To His Friend, Master R.L., in praise of music and poetry, and contains several clues that it was in fact written uh, not by Barnfield or by William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, but by Vere. Uh, in the last line, for instance, the poet describes himself as a knight which makes both William of Stratford and Richard Barnfield unlikely authors. Uh, Oxford, obviously, as we all know, is often described in this way, most notably by Thomas Nash in 1596, when he writes of uh, that honourable knight about court yet attending, to whom I wish no better fortune than the forelocks of fortune he had hold of in his youth, and no higher fame than he hath purchased himself by his pen being the first in our language I have encountered that repurified poetry from art's pedantism and that instructed it to speak courtly. Our patron, our Phoebus, our first Orpheus or quintessence of invention he is. The uh, second clue I want you to listen out for when Derek reads it is nestled in what the poet says about Spencer. To me, he writes, Spencer's deep conceit, i.e. his rare device, needs no defence. Now, this seems to refer to a verse conversation written between Spencer and Vere in the paratext of the first edition of The Fairy Queen in 1590, in which Spencer writes to Vere, saying that he, quote, doth crave to be defended by Vere from envy's poisonous bite. Vere responds in a poem subscribed ignoto, meaning the unknown stating that Spencer needs, quote, no defence, 
as his rare device is such that any defense would only cause him to be envied, not prevent the envy. And as many of us know, uh, that little poem has echoes in Johnson's remarks about Shakespeare in the first folio of 1623. And finally, to switch from the third person in the title to his friend, Master R.L., to the first person in the poem itself, and I in deep delight, and I uh, the other, allows for the possibility that Barnfield plonked this poem by Vere into a short anthology of his own poems to make a point. And that point, by the way, is only properly made by reading the first four poems in succession, the fourth being Shakespeare's As It Fell Upon a Day. So, without further ado, let us now hear our patron, our Phoebus, our first Orpheus, Derek Jacobi, reading this intriguing and eloquent sonnet aloud. If music and sweet poetry agree, as they must needs, the sister and the brother, then must the love be great twixt thee and me, because thou lovest the one and I the other. Dowland to thee is dear, whose heavenly touch upon the lute doth ravish human sense. Spencer to me, whose deep conceit is such as passing all conceit, needs no defense. Thou lovest to hear the sweet melodious sound that Phoebus lute, the queen of music, makes, and I, in deep delight am chiefly drowned when as himself to singing he betakes. One God is God of both, as poets feign. One night loves both, and both in thee remain. Thank you, Derek, very much indeed. We are very excited to have Annabel Leventon not as we are used to seeing her in a speaking role, but this time in a singing role. Yes, she is going to sing for us some lines that Shakespeare originally gave to Feste the Clown in Twelfth Night. Annabel sang this in a student production uh, when she took the part of Viola. The context is no doubt familiar to everyone here, but just in case, Duke Orsino sends his new favorite companion, Cesario, to woo Countess Olivia on his behalf. Olivia falls instantly in love with Cesario, while Cesario, who is really Viola, disguised as a boy, is deep in love with Orsino. Orsino asks for a song to fit his melancholy mood, and when Annabel was Viola, she sang this for him. Come away, dead, and in sad cypress let me be laid. Fly away, fly away, breath, I am slain by a fair crew maid. My shroud of white stuck all with you, oh, prepare it. My part of death no one so true did share it. Not a flower, not a flower sweet on my black coffin let there be strewn not a friend not a friend grieve my poor corpse where my bones shall be thrown a thousand thousand sighs to say lay me away sad true lover never find my grave to weep there. 
Beautiful. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Now, Hank Whittemore, who we saw a little while ago, is known and beloved of all Oxfordians, uh, beloved for his high intelligence, charismatic speaking, and his excellent books, The Monument and A Hundred Reasons Why Shakespeare Was the Earl of Oxford, which I would warmly recommend uh, to anyone who has not read them. Uh, less known, perhaps, to Oxfordians is he was for many years an actor, uh, journalist, and a creator of TV documentaries. And he's going to read uh, to us now uh, the words of Shylock from The Merchant of Venice. And just before he does that, um, I would like you to consider, and he's going to read uh, to us now uh, the words of Shylock from The Merchant of Venice. And just before he does that, um, I would like you to consider the connection of the words that he's going to read uh, to something that was published by a man called Gosson in 1579. And in this book uh, that Gosson writes, he talks about a play called The Jew. And he writes to the gentlewomen of London, if you perceive yourselves in any danger at your own doors, either allured by courtesy in the day or assaulted with music in the night, close up your eyes, stop your ears, tie up your tongues. When they speak, answer not. When they hallow, stoop not. When they sigh, laugh at them. When they sue, scorn them, shun their company, never be seen where they resort. Now, I think when Hank reads the lovely piece of Shakespeare, uh, you'll realise an extraordinary similarity between the two, and that brings up, of course, huge questions for Oxfordians, and it should for Stratfordians, about the date of this play, The Merchant of Venice. So over to you, Hank. Why? Are there, are there masks? Now, hear you, me, Jessica. You l lock up my doors. And when you hear the drum and that vile squealing of the wry-necked fife, clamor not you up to the casements then, nor thrust your head into the public street to gaze on Christian fools with varnished faces, but stop my house's ears, I mean my casements, let not the sound of shallow foppery enter my sober house. By Jacob's staff, I swear, I have no mind of feasting forth tonight, but I will go. Go before me, Sirrah. Say, I will come. Thank you, Hank, for that delighting rendition of Shylock. We're now going to hear from Howard Gayson on Commedia dell'arte, a subject upon which he is hugely knowledgeable and experienced a scholar, director, performer, teacher for over 20 years, specialising in this particular form of Italian play that so influenced Shakespeare. He has run several commedia acting companies, including his present venture, the Columbina Theatre Company, which he runs with writer and poet Oswald, Peter Oswald, who once held Shakespeare's job as writer in residence at the Globe. So a warm welcome then to Howard Gayton. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Venice, where we lay our scene. In this talk, I will introduce the theatre form of Commedia dell'arte. I will attempt to explain what Commedia is, give a brief history of its development in the Italian Renaissance up to the present, and set it within the context of uh, Shakespeare's time and explain why I think it's important and how Commedia functions in terms of characters and plots. So, uh, Commedia translates as the um, acting of, of skill or of professional theatre. It's important in theatre history because Commedia was the first professional theatre. In 1545, in Padua, there's the first signed contract of a theatre company. Now, before that, 
uh, theatre was carried out via guilds uh, or under the regis of various lords or princes. Uh, we know that in England, for example, the Chamberlain's men or the King's men. So this was a very important uh, departure in terms of theatre. Um, as part of the rise of the merchants and capitalism, in a way, uh, that Renaissance Italy forged, and particularly in Venice, actors became professionals. Now, Commedia was developed in the furnace of the Venetian Republic. And as a result, it contains within it a good deal of influences from humanist and other esoteric Renaissance thought. It was primarily an improvised form of theatre, and, and its roots are kind of unclear. The, the general belief is it was born from a mix of the courtly amateur written drama of the Commedia Erudita, and uh, that was mixed with the rough and ready street theatre of the mountebanks, with their masks and folk roots. Now, if the Erudita looked back to Greek and Roman influences for plot lines and story and character, then the leather masks of the Commedia, such as this fine example, Polchinella, uh, would have, it's one of the distinctive features of Commedia, the masks, they would have come from the folk traditions that would have been preserved undocumented from the more pagan rites of the Roman uh, theatre and, and folk pageants. So from its birth in the Venetian Republic, Commedia spread throughout Europe. Troops of performers became popular amongst the courts and in the marketplaces of Germany, um, of what we now know as Czech Republic, such as in, in Prague, right down into the Iberian Peninsula, and especially in France, where it became known as, was known as the Italian comedy, and then through the plays of Moliere became the Comédie Française. Um, I've just realised in, in hearing uh, that this is all about music, that, um, of course, Commedia was the root of opera. There was so much music in Commedia, and opera was developed out of uh, Commedia. Um, so Commedia had spread into France in the sort of 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, very influential on, on Molière, French playwrights, and in the uh, French courts. And at the turn of the 20th century, Commedia was a major influence on Meerhold, who was a Russian dramaturg. He worked uh, under Stanislavski and then separated from Stanislavski. Um, and Meerhold had a particular interest in Harlequin and his magical and mercurial properties. Um, talking of Hermes, Harlequin is often seen as being kind of her Hermes, hermetic in, in his uh, characteristics. Uh, and this development from Meerholt can be seen as one of the forefathers of physical comedy in Western theatre. He broke away from the more cerebral Stanislavski and approach to theatre to find other means of physical and visual expression. Commedia influenced the great German playwright and director Brecht, helping him to find non-naturalistic means of expression for his actors. And after the Second World War, in order to cement a culture for the newly formed Italian state, um, the mask maker Sartori, the playwright Dario Fo, and the great movement teacher Jacques Lecoq were tasked with recreating Commedia in Italy from the pictures and scenarios that were extant. So yet again, Commedia exerted an influence on Western theatre, and again in this more physical theatre route. I mean, think of Lecoq's influence uh, was huge, uh, particularly in England, particularly in the 1980s, where he influenced companies like Complicité, uh, and this massive physical exp uh, explosion of physical theatre in the UK. As a side note, uh, because I'm a Punch and Judy professor uh, as well, um, working summer seasons on the seafront in Timmouth every year, our English Mr Punch has his roots in Commedia. Here he is, Mr Punch. <laughs> he has his roots in the character of Porcinello, uh, mixed in with kind of English jesters and clowns, such as William Kemp. Uh, and of course, pantomime developed out of the, this Commedia and the touring seaside uh, Piero troops, which were huge in, on seasides in the early 20th century, they came out of Commedia as well. So Commedia is hugely influential. So this brings me on to this thing. Why, why is Commedia important in the context of the works attributed to Shakespeare? Um, I... If one thinks of there being a style or genre of theatre which can be called Shakespearean, 
um, one can see it's lasted with numerous in reinventions for nearly 500 years. And this is also true of Commedia dell'arte. And I can't think of any other form of Western theatre which has lasted in this way. There are revivals of Reformation theatre and theatre forms grow out of other forms, but there's something about the works attributed to Shakespeare and of Commedia that keep reinventing themselves and keep being able to teach us something about ourselves and our societies, even as we outwardly seem to progress. I suggest that one of the reasons for this is that both these forms of theatre have deeply entwined archetypal themes which transcend the mundane, but which are also tied so closely to the personal and to common human desires and, and human esteems that somehow they're both timeless and yet very much of the time, wh whenever that time happens to be. Um, in Midsummer Night's Dream, the archetypal world of Titania and Oberon are set against the groundlings of Bottom and other rude mechanicals, and of course there are the lovers. And this is so typical of Commedia too. The masks and some of the themes of the stories uh, in Commedia plots are set within an archetypal world, but the flawed characters have all the elements that make us human, jealousies, love, passions, obsession, stupidity. I think it's the mix of these deep archetypes and very real human concerns that have seen these two genres continually reinvent themselves over time. So how does Commedia function? It's traditionally non-scripted, which means it's semi-improvised. Uh, if the original Commedia companies were formed from actors who performed in the Commedia Erudita, they would have had many poetic scenarios, uh, especially love scenes, which they could draw on. These uh, became known as Lazzi, little scenes which could be called upon if the moment seemed right. Added to this would be physical Lazzi of the pratfalls and sight gags, which again could be called upon when the moment arose, which came out of the street theatre performances. Since companies stayed together for long periods of time, actors would often take on roles for, for a whole lifetime. Uh, they would get to know their characters and the other actors' characters so well that they could quite easily improvise. Because of the improvisational nature of comedy, it hasn't left much in the way of texts, uh, but Flaminio Scala compiled some scenarios in 1611. This is an example of a scene in the Commedia play. So this is what you get if you're an actor. It's called The Tragic Events, Act One, The City of Florence, Horatio and Flavia. The disguised Horatio arrives in Florence with Flavio, his friend from Rome. He tells Flavio that it has been a month since he killed in his city of Florence, a captain, son of a doctor, who is an old enemy of his family and whose daughter he loves very much. He adds that he has returned to find out if Isabella still loves him and Flavio promises to help in, in every way possible. They knock on the door of the inn. So that, that's what the actors have to play with, just the bare bones of the scene. And that would develop live depending on the audience and how the actors felt that night. One night a scene might have a new game or a known Lazzi, Another night, it might be more perfunctory. I think of it as if you think of it like uh, playing jazz. So there's a tune which the players know. Uh, some nights the muse takes the, the players and they add in riffs and extras from their repertoire, or they might even invent something entirely new. To look further into the structure of Commedia, we now turn to the characters who drive the plots. Often in Commedia plots, as in the scene above, there are two main households, two households, both alike in dignity, perhaps not. Perhaps both alike in infamy might be more appropriate. So the way I see it, if you imagine an Italian piazza, the Italian sun is beating down and either side of this piazza are two tall houses, one dressed in gaudy gold decorations and the other somewhat crumbling. And each of these households has a family with a head of the family, children and servants. Um, I, I'm just going to take a, a slight diversion here to, to look at the relationships within, within each household uh, and the relationships that households to each other. Because there's two images that I find useful when I'm teaching uh, Commedia. There's actually the, the Kabbalah tree of life the Sephirot of the Kabbalah, uh, and the relationships in Romeo and Juliet. They seem to merge very well. A um, mask maker of my old comedy company, Offerboom, um, a man called Ninian Kinnear Wilson, who unfortunately died a few years ago, once emerged after about a year of being out of touch to expound the idea that Commedia has embedded within it Renaissance understanding of the Kabbalic tree of life. He pointed out that the form developed within the courts of the Medici and in the Renaissance 
for whom we know the esoteric was an obsession. And I found it really useful to picture these two households in that way. It helps to see the relationships of the characters. Now at the top, you have the Keitha or the crown. In Romeo and Juliet, this is Paris. In Midsummer Night's Dream, this is Theseus. In Commedia, this is Magnifico. Magnifico, like a king or prince or president, is almost more of a role in a character. The person is subsumed within the deep archetype of, of what it is to be that. Now, below this head of the city are two pillars. These are the two households, two families, the owners of the aforementioned houses. In the Gordy house is Signor Pantaloni, literally Mr. Trousers. And um, he is a merchant representing the rise of the merchant classes in the Renaissance Italy. And my character is that of a miser or a schemer for money, or oh, both. Uh, I am old in Renaissance terms, lecherous, a cockerel. I preen myself and so off. Now, normally I have money, uh, though I can fall on hard times, especially if my ships have been lost at sea or attacked by pirates. I am nouveau riche, hence the gaudy decorations. In the house opposite, there is Il Doctore, maybe a doctor of law, maybe of medicine. I am uh, uh, verbose. Uh, and rotund, uh, a lover of food and of spouting information, any information, uh, preferably with uh, sprinklings of Latin, ipso facto, ergo, sum, quad, amo, amat, amat, to prove my point. Uh, one can imagine, uh, like so many landed families, uh, that my wealth is all in property, which is, of course, falling down. Now, Commonly, there is a lot of animosity between these two. Perhaps Signor Doctore needs to borrow money from the crass Pantalone, and Pantalone wants to rise his family's prestige by marrying into the doctor's line, either marrying himself to the doctor's daughter, or perhaps marrying his daughter to one of the doctor's sons. Now, these children are commonly known as li enamorati, the lovers, or first and second actors. In this structure, which we're envisaging with these pillars below the head of the household, um, they lie just below, first actors just below, and then uh, second actors, the younger um, lovers below them. And they have their own intrigues and plots, which either directly or indirectly impact their fathers. Maybe like Romeo and Juliet, the younger children are in love, but the parents won't let them marry, so they plan to elope. Or maybe the older children, or first actors as they're known, fall in love with each other, or fall out of love with each other, and decide to take revenge. Under these characters, with their madness, obsessions, loves and desires, we then have the servants, or Zani, probably a shortened version of Giovanni, John. These long-nosed masks are migrants who, like Shakespeare's naive clowns, have come into the city looking for work. We are uh, uh, lazy, hungry, uh, lustful idiots, uh, but we can be a very useful tool for complication of plot points. For example, confusion of letters. <laughs> now, there are some servants who are more wily. Uh, maybe they're like Shakespearean fools, for example. Uh, you have the coquettish, intelligent Columbina, who can run rings around Pantaloni, and are often would-be lover, the quick-witted, acrobatic Harlequin. An interesting side note, one of the distinctive things about Commedia is that unlike in England, women performed on stage, though they were not traditionally those of mask roles. So this is how I picture the basic Commedia structure then. Two households with master, children of various ages, an agency, and servants of various levels of wit. Somehow their interconnecting wishes, desires and obsessions sort of seem to function. And then the outsider enters the town, bringing chaos in his or her wake. Often a capitano, and often a Spanish Capitano, because the Iberian mercenaries uh, roamed around Italy at the time. The Capitano is a cowardly, womanizing, heavy drinking braggart. <laughs> Imagine that I have been traveling up the coast, leaving gambling debts, chaos and burning towns in my wake. <laughs> Off to war, or rather to drink. <laughs> 
The above description of characters, I'm sure, will lead to various comparisons of Shakespeare's characters. Falstaff, perhaps, as the captain, or, or Sir Toby Belch. Belch. Uh, what about the rude mechanicals as Azani and Hermione, Her Hermia, Lysandra, Demetrius as Inamorati? Uh, and Harlequin as Puck, perhaps, and, of course, Pantaloni as Shylock. So there are character influences on Shakespeare, that, and there are clearly plot influences on Shakespeare. How did he come across these influences? So there's evidence in the 1570s of Commedia troops coming to England. Um, and of course, we know, unlike Dominic Rabb, that there has always been exchange of goods and ideas between England and continental Europe across the English Channel. And there would have been cultural ideas, particularly coming through France, where Commedia was starting to put down deep roots. There is evidence of Commedia troops performing in the Elizabethan court in 1573 and 74. And in 1574, the Lord Mayor granted passports for Commedia players. The Vagabond Act of 1572, which meant that players had to be attached to lords, was perhaps partly in response to the Italian players who, like in France, were threatening to replace homegrown actors because they were so popular. Uh, the love of the Italian style of theatre, as well as other types of art, waxed and waned over the course of the 16th century. There's no doubt that through the 16th century, English playwrights were influenced by all things Italian, and at times they were heavily criticised for copying the crassness, even if it was popular with audiences. So it's no wonder that there seems so many comparisons within Shakespeare's work and commedia. The question is why and how? Now, perhaps the writer of Shakespeare in plays saw commedia in England. That's certainly possible. While there isn't evidence of wide touring of Commedia companies in England, as there is on the continent, there is some. Uh, perhaps Shakespeare worked with English actors who had performed in France and Italy and learnt the Italian style, such as the actor Monday, who worked uh, for a while with Oxford's men and who in 1579 visited Naples, Venice and Padua and was known to perform ad lib in the Italian style. There's no doubt that throughout the 16th century, English playwrights were influenced by all things Italian. But perhaps the writer of the works attributed to Shakespeare, spent a good deal of time in Italy watching the Commedia Erudita and the Commedia dell'arte in its natural home. Perhaps there were plot ideas and vibrant characters, and there was an understanding of the archetypal and hermetic nature of these works of theatre, which were brought back to the Elizabethan court through someone who had deep knowledge and connection to the Italian courts. It is certainly an intriguing possibility. Thank you. Howard, that was absolutely wonderful. And thank you very much and very funny. And how, how brilliant those masks are that you just put them on and they only cover a small part of your face and yet you completely transform into Capitano, into uh, uh, whoever those people are. That's absolutely wonderful. And I have to say that the um, comments that have been springing up as you were making that fine talk uh, were all uh, hugely happy positive and excited by it so i hope we will hear more of you in future and that was a, a wonderful contribution to our conference thank you very much indeed now to the poem if uh, women could be fair and not fond and that poem was subscribed to the earl of oxford in the john finnett manuscript and later on we shall be hearing william bird's beautiful setting of this lyric sung by hannah grove to the lute accompaniment of elizabeth pallet but for now, let us hear just the words read aloud for us in the rich and Roskian tones of our venerable founder, Charles Beauclair. Woman's Changeableness by E. O. If women could be fair and yet not fond, or that their love were firm, not fickle still, I would not marvel that they make men bond by service long to purchase their goodwill. But when I see how frail those creatures are, I muse that men forget themselves so far. To mark the choice they make and how they change, how oft from Phoebus do they flee to Pan, unsettled still, like haggards wild they range, these gentle birds that fly from man to man, who would not scorn and shake them from the fist and let them fly, fair fools, which way they list. Yet for our sport we fawn and flatter both to pass the time when nothing else can please and train them to our lure with subtle oath till, weary of their wiles, ourselves we ease. 
And then we say, when we their fancy try to play with fools, oh, what a fool was I. Thank you, beautiful Charles. Again, another prime example when fatuous, uneducated people come to you and say, uh, Edward de Vere couldn't possibly have been Shakespeare because his poems were such rubbish. Uh, you only have to listen to, to one of those beautifully read as it was there to see that this man was uh, a child prodigy and got onto the writing of poetry very early and wrote it very well indeed. Now, uh, for the last hour of our conference tonight, we shall be enjoying a concert of Elizabethan music and poetry with connections to Shakespeare Vere. The programme, which was especially contrived for us by Amarilli, Elizabeth Pallett and Hannah Grove, was recorded a few days ago in Malvern. I was present at the recording and I can tell you that you're in for a very special treat. After the session, I had a chance to talk to Elizabeth Pallett about the lute, an instrument to which she has devoted all of her professional life. I'm here at the moment with one of the world's most distinguished and brilliant lutenists. And she's in command of something called Lute Web. I think she even set up Lute Web. And so therefore she's almost the centre of the world when it comes to online dealings with lutes. And some of us don't know a lot about lutes. And we're going to talk a little bit about the instrument, about its history and about the person who's holding it, and that is Elizabeth Pallet. And we're going to see Elizabeth later on this evening with Hannah Grove singing a lot of Shakespeare via um, songs. So welcome, very nice, and thank you for joining in with the De Vere Society Fun. It's a delight and a privilege. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, now you're holding what looks like a very uh, beautiful instrument there, and that is the lute. Yes. And I want to start just asking you how, I mean, most people don't, when they're children, they don't say, I want to learn the lute. How did you, I presume, transition from guitar to lute? What made you want to yes, learn? Yes, I did indeed. Um, as a very young age, I guess the age of seven, I, um, uh, I picked up a guitar. Luckily, uh, my school had uh, group guitar lessons, so I went from there. Um, at the very early age of 12, I started getting interested in the lute because um, I had quite an isolated upbringing uh, on a hill, <laughs> on a farm, and so my one delight was to go going to the record, uh, to the library, to to pick up a record every week, rent a record every week, and one of these happened to be Julian Breen playing John Dowland on the lute, and uh, realizing that um, I was playing this music on the guitar, and in fact on the wrong instrument sort of got my curiosity going. So what did you, I mean it's a long time ago to ask you <laughs> how you remembered that incident but but did you actually even that long ago think there's a very distinctive sound difference between this and did you think it really fits the Dowland music better? Yes I did very much so even though uh, we all know that Julian Bream is primarily a guitarist who took up the lute. Um, it's the very nature of their instrument, the double stringing of the instrument, the holding of the instrument is very, very different um, from, from the guitar. And, um, and I guess because at that young age it was a little bit of a, a leap of faith on my parents' behalf because suddenly this child said, I want to play the lute and they're thinking, goodness me. That's very unusual. So if it hadn't been for their encouragement at that age, uh, at my age, um, going out there, finding a lute maker. Well, yes, I imagine their, <laughs> their first difficulty as a farmer Absolutely. in the middle of the sticks. Yes. Doing things is how do we get hold of a lute? Yes. My daughter wants to play the lute. <laughs> yes. So um, it's thanks to them, really, that they did persevere with that. And they found a, a very brilliant lute maker who's, who still makes lutes, living in Norwich, called David Van Edwards. And um, he happened to have a lute. <laughs> and so we made the pilgrimage, we bought this lute and uh, found a teacher. And from then on, I didn't really look back. And it was a question of finding the right teacher that allowed me to um, understand the hi historical context of the lute in order to be able to play it properly. Because uh, one of the things I, I didn't want to do is, is transfer my skills as a guitarist onto the lute, because 
it's completely different. Completely different. And so, I mean, it's actually a very rare instrument now. It's odd to think that, that at the time that we're interested in, the 1580s, 1590s, and 1610, it was probably the most popular musical instrument there was, unless you had a fife or something. Uh, well, uh, uh, actually, its zenith was in, in 1590, um, and um, we, we hold all our gratitude, actually, to very keen players, very keen amateur players, who compiled these manuscripts. Uh, because uh, professional players wouldn't have done it. <laughs> you get very, very little material um, or evidence of John Dowland writing his compositions down. Um, so professionals didn't write their pieces down so much. Uh, there are formal examples of that, of course. But generally, on the whole, we have amateur players, really good amateur players, or, or players that are taking lessons, and then they compile these lessons, they write them out, they compile them, it's bound. And then you, you have uh, a, a wonderful collections like the Matthew Holmes collection, uh, which spans from 1580 all the way up to perhaps 1610. And he, he wasn't a lute player himself. Uh, but he's very, very interested in the music. He was present, presenter at um, Christ Church in Oxford. Uh, but this, this nine books of lute music represents you know, a wonderful, uh, significant body of work. So I'm presuming that lute players were on the whole pretty educated. I mean, if you're saying amateur lute players were writing this down, because I mean, yeah. the general level of literacy, just writing English, was pretty low yeah. in 1590 yes. in England. Yes. So presumably the people who played the lute were all educated. They were, it's a very specific group, actually, I have to say. Um, it tended to be uh, um, of a noble rank, or you had some sort of affiliation with the court, or you were part of the court. Um, uh, of a leading household. There is often evidence of music making and lute playing in leading households. Um, and it was very much considered part of your education to be able to play music, sing music. Girls and music. boys? or Very much girls and boys, although I have to say, um, in terms of professional uh, side, uh, during that time it was mainly males who played the lute, but you have books like the um, Margaret Board book and the Jane Pickering book, which were compiled by young ladies, usually pre-marriage, as part of their education. And the instruments, I mean, were, were they brought mainly from Italy, or were they actually made in England at the time? Well, the instruments were, obviously, again, it wasn't a cheap hobby. <laughs> um, the instruments... Uh, um, uh, originated, there were two centres, there was the northern Italy that were renowned for making these instruments and also in Germany and we know that there were Italian makers in London and obviously after that there would have been offshoots, there would have been English makers who would have learnt from, the, from these key people. So to source an instrument uh, was difficult, I, th I should imagine you had to have connections to do so. Um, and also, the upkeep of the instrument was very yeah, difficult. Yeah, so you know, what, what, were the, what were the strings made of, and how did you get them replaced? It's pretty <laughs> difficult if they pass. Well, uh, they, I think they did snap a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thomas Mace uh, recommended you, string, you, you, you tighten the first string as, hard, as, as, as tight as you can on the first top string until it's just about to break and then you tune the rest of it. So you can imagine it was always right. kind of on, on now, breaking point. I, I know that I'm sure that people uh, watching us will be itching to hear a little, <laughs> a little bit. You mentioned a, a, a slightly technical word back then, double stringing. Yes. Um, can you explain what that is and why it's necessary? Yes, so um, uh, most people can relate to the guitar, which is single strung, six, six strings. So um, uh, but this has double courses. Uh, it's tuned in G, it has um, uh, intervals of a fourth but a third in the middle, and it has these di low diapason strings which are tuned in, ox uh, in, in octaves. So for example, um, if I were to just go down the strings... You get this really nice rich sound. Double courses. Now, when you say double courses, you mean two strings. Two strings. 
strings together, together that you pluck at the yes. same time you pluck at the that same are pitched time. at exactly the same note. Absolutely, yes. So yes. it just gives it, what, a sort of extra yes. richness it's, of sound. Yes, have, exactly. I have yes. two. But I notice the very top string is not so what you're calling double strung. It's no, a single string. This is a single string called the chanterelle because uh, uh, the idea is it brings out the melody. It's, it's bell-like. So can, can you give us an example, just a short example, say the melody on the top string, so we get the sense of that tone of it? Uh, so. It's very beautiful, it's very clear. How would, how would you describe the difference between that sound and the sound of, a, of a, say, the top string of a guitar? It, the, one of the big principal differences between a lute player and a guitar player is that a lute player will not use any nails. So they're using the flesh of their fingers to create the notes. So it's, it's, um, it's a very personal, physical thing to be able to play the lute because you've got the feel of the string on your finger you're playing with a guitar, um, you've got the nail aspect, uh, it, the, the technique is very much uh, thumb outside, so the whole idea is it's, it's definitely um, more percussive. Yes, yes. Louder and I wonder, sound, I wonder if that's what helps the lute be so, I mean, given that it's a plucked instrument, it's, it's, it's very vocal. I mean, it's, it's, it, of all that type of instrument, it's the one that really sounds as if it's singing, in a sense. Yes. Particularly when you play, obviously when you play melody on it. But. Yes. Well, I mean, the other thing is that the, the lute technique very much differs from the guitar because it stems from the plectrum. If you think of the early medieval lutes and the gittins, they were all played with a plectrum, a quill, um, or a piece of bone. So you have this up-down, up-down um, idea. <laughs> This is for this very fast division work that's possible. Um. Yes, uh -huh. now with, with, with guitars, we're so used to the idea of, sort of strumming. Yes. You know, someone goes chung, 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 and someone yeah. sings a boring song on the top of it. <laughs> but I notice with a lot of these, the sort of 1590 songs, the lute is not often strumming, is it, in fact? No. Um, there, uh, well, it's very difficult to pin it down, uh, and this is why we're very, um, uh, very grateful for the sources that we have because it gives us just that idea of what they played and how they played it, because uh, most of it was an oral tradition. So um, transmission probably would have varied quite a bit. So until you've got it on paper, that's when it starts to get fixed. So, um, uh, John Dowland's um, first book of Song and Airs, which was published in 1597, is this first fixed idea we have in England of, of how the lute is played or the polyphony that's involved in, in accompanying a song. Uh, but there is another side to that as well. There is this improvisatory side where everybody would have known a ground bass or they would have known a chord sequence and they would have made their own accompaniment. So, for example, the concert that we're going to perform later on today, uh, we're going to perform a song from Hamlet called Robin to the Greenwoods Gone. Beautiful uh, tune. <laughs> Beautiful tune. People sometimes in their ignorance think that Greensleeves is the only great tune to come out of the Elizabethan age, but are you able to give us a sense of that? Yes, I Robin can. To the Greenwood. So I can give you an idea of the, the tune and then I'm going to give you an idea of a more improvised accompaniment to the tune. So you have to sort of imagine the tune uh, played along. <laughs> the main tune and then um, uh, the way that uh, this would have been played everybody would have known the tune and they would have known the chord sequence underneath so they would have um, extemporized a accompaniment to it so it might have sound something like this And 
completely beautiful, isn't it? It is, and I love the way that you can um, you can inject this sort of music with your own personality. That's what I like the most about it. It is it is quite different to the music from well, let's say from music as it developed from the second half of the seventeenth century, when I think there's a there's a much more standard pattern, not both not only in harmony but also in in in, in melody. And from from the late seventeenth century, I think we all just naturally understand that music. If you're brought up with that, as in fact I was, your first jump into Tudor music can be a little bit alienating. I mean, I know you've been involved in this for so long, it probably means nothing to you to say that there is something slightly alienating, or can be. Yeah. Um, and I've come slowly to, to, to Tudor, and now I absolutely think it's as beautiful as any music could possibly be. But I'm going to ask you a difficult question, which is to try and uh, see if you can just explain somehow in words what it is about the sort of Tudor music that you're playing, that sort of songs and lutes things that makes it so so special and so beautiful when you when you get the hang of it. Um, well, it's two things really. Uh, it's the the counterpoint and the way you have um, melodies interweaving in 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 you know. Um, Yes, which, which for, the, for those who don't realise, that's what counterpoint means. It's, yes. it's the running together of, of more than one melody simultaneously. Absolutely, yeah. And so um, it's just, for me, the sheer genius of writing that uh, gives me a bit of a buzz. Um, uh, also, I like the fact that um, uh, the, some of the compositions, particularly loop compositions, are based upon a tune and then a division. So the division is where you get the tune um, varied and it can be in, in various runs, it can be in all sorts of different forms, but that can be jolly interesting just to see how, how far this can go. Um, also the historical context because um, uh, I really enjoy looking at the original manuscripts, I enjoy the personal um, little touches that you find in these manuscripts. Somebody ran out of ink or somebody wanted to use the bottom to, to write a note. Um, the Matthew Holmes collection contains prayers, it even contains little legal notes. And it's the human side uh, that somebody was beavering away at this music, just like I am today. Yes, and, and it lives. <laughs> Trying to get it right and being moved by that music and um, moulding it to your own personality putting your own touch on it, putting your own bit of ornamentation into it, shaping the melodies. And what I like is there's, there's nobody dictating that. There's nobody saying, well, this is loud, there's crescendo here, there's rallentando here. There's not, none of those sort of uh, musical directions. So you yes, have so they don't even write things like piano or forte or allegro. No, all that came later, didn't it? No, not at all. I mean, the... the, the the most common thing you'll get is it's either a galliard or it's a pavan or it's a, it's a la volta and then from that you should know the, the sort of speed that you should take the piece. All those pieces you've just mentioned are, are dances, are they not? That's correct, yes. So a volta would be yes. a pretty rapid one. Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Um, now you mentioned counterpoint and I wondered if you could, if you're able to give us a little example of how perhaps the, that instrument can play more than one melody, as it were, simultaneously? Um, so, uh, I'll take the same tune, Romit, to the Greenwood Gone, again, because it's, it is uh, such a well-known tune, um, and it existed not just during this time, but well into the 17th century as well. People just used the tune and they would put different text to it. So, um, this, is, this is from the Folger Dallin Lute book, and it's dated around about um, 1594 to 1610. These dates are a little bit rough because it's hard to tell. But you'll be able to hear the tune and you'll be able to hear the, ca the, the extra melodies that are put in and um, how the tune develops and progresses. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Well, I think you can see and hear from that exactly why uh, people like Edward de Vere were so in love with this instrument, so in love with music at the time. Shakespeare, of course, said if you don't understand music, uh, then you can't be trusted. And I think that's probably quite a good point. There is something utterly pure and, and moving and beautiful and truthful that seems to come out of this Elizabethan music. Now, I hope you're going to stick around with us um, because tonight we're going to hear this wonderful concert played by Elizabeth and Hannah Grove and they're going to be singing a whole range of songs that connect to Edward de Vere and to Shakespeare and I can assure you that they are extremely moving and extremely beautiful. So thank you very much for giving us a little uh, a run in an intro and I hope that will also help when you start the concert to know vaguely uh, what you're listening out for and to. Those of you who aren't particularly familiar with the lute will have very whetted appetites because uh, I certainly am I'm actually entranced by this, this style of music. It's almost all I want to listen to now. Um, so stay, stay tuned for that later tonight. Now, a, a short dialogue between Hamlet and Guildenstern brought to life for us by actor and producer Richard Clifford, who is familiar to so many of us in the SAQ for his wonderful Shakespearean readings, both for the De Vere Society and the Shakespeare Authorship Trust. He is a very brilliant Shakespearean actor and is joined in this deliciously teasing dialogue by another, our patron, Derek Jacobi. I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? My Lord, I cannot. I pray you. Believe me, I cannot. I do beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. It is as easy as lying. Govern these vengeances with your fingers and thumb. Give it breath with your mouth. And it will discourse most eloquent music. Look, you, these are the stops. But these cannot, I command, to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Why, look, you know how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me for my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there is much music, excellent voice, in this little organ. Yet cannot you make it speak? Sprut! Do you think I'm easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me. Yet you cannot play upon me. Very excellent. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Derek. I first met our next guest over 40 years ago when I was a humble concert agent and record producer, and he had just started an early instrument group called the Dufi Collective, a massively exciting band that went from strength to strength for 20 years. William Lyons is Professor of Medieval and Renaissance Studies at the Royal College and early music advisor to the Globe Theatre and he's a composer and he's arranged and advised on hundreds of scores for historic costume, drama, films and plays. So we welcome him to the De Vere Society today to tell us about instruments and hier hierarchies in early modern theatre. Thank you, William Lyons. This talk is about music and musicians in early modern theatre, particularly in London. And the music in early modern theatre is, is pretty well documented, but little is known of the actual musicians who would have played this music. In this paper, I'm going to survey the various paths that would lead a musician into the theatre. I'll also suggest that through analysis of the hierarchical and otherness of certain instruments, can be revealed the status of musician who would have been employed in theatres at the time. Since the early medieval period, the distinction between loud and soft or quiet instruments had separated the loud wind and trumpets from those softer plucked bowed and blown instruments. The former were played by court and civic professional musicians whilst the soft instruments were deemed suitable for non-professional as well as for professional players. There was a social acceptance that some instruments were more suitable for certain levels of society than others. As James Clareland uh, stated in the Institution of a Young Nobleman in 1607, delight not to
to be in your own person a player upon instruments, especially upon such as commonly men get their living with. So the learning of playing of Sean, cornet and trombone was very much the province of the professional trade musician during the 16th and for most of the 17th centuries. In London, as was the case in most emergent powerful cities at this time, a civic band of professional drawn from musicians trained through the traditional livery company system of master and apprentice. At the Royal Court too, this categorization was similarly maintained until well into the 17th century. Other routes to the musical profession came from non-livery based training. Choristers were routinely taught to play instruments from an early age. Uh, again, viols, lutes, keyboards and of course singing predominated. In the university plays at Cambridge, the students played viols and the regals, a reed organ, in performance and sung, whilst the Cambridge waits were hired to provide extra music, most likely on the louder wind instruments not played by the students. In a society structured almost exclusively on hierarchy, it makes sense that there were certain musical instruments that remained in the ambit of a trade, whilst others had a more elevated status and were learnt and played for private entertainment by members of the upper echelons of society. The historian Christopher Marsh perhaps uses the clearest distinction for this. He says, occupational musician for those who made their music, music their livelihood and recreational musician for all others. The London Waits were highly regarded and much in demand. They were also hired for their versatility and were tested for this in the appointment process, which would often pit two likely contenders for a post against each other to assess their skills on several instruments. Throughout the 16th century, a greater range of instruments was added to the Waits collection. As you can see, they bought several instruments, sackbuts, which were the, is the English name for the trombone, were very expensive instruments and bought by the city for the use of the weights, a set of vials, cornets, recorders, and a kirtle, which is a, an early bassoon. And into the 17th century, the violin starts to appear in the payment records as well as lutenists and singers, so the weights expanding out. Thus, by the late 16th century, the Waits had amassed all the instruments needed for both soft and loud music and set about cementing their grip on musical activities in the City of London. With the rise of the theatre in London, an opportunity presented itself for further employment. The provision of music for plays by Waits certainly had precedence, as there is evidence of touring theatre troops, those officially associated with noble patronage hiring the local Waits band when visiting a town on tour. Also, as well as the aforementioned student players in Cambridge, the Inns of Court in London employed the city music, the Waits, for their plays. As theatres began to proliferate, a music become more established at indoor playhouses, and in particular the Blackfriars Playhouse. Then the employment of a theatre band in addition to the acting musicians in the company became f more frequent. The role of actor musician would still have been the norm in theatre companies, as hiring in a separate band of professional musicians would be costly and log logistically problematic. The choristers and grammar schoolboys of St Paul's would have routinely learnt musical instruments alongside their vocal training, and these would have been utilised, surely, on the stage during their heyday in the 1570s and later at the beginning of the next century in the form of the boys' companies. At the Blackfriars Playhouse, as an essential ele element, music was woven in and around performances, and it may have had greater promises and resources than at other contemporary spaces. The popularity of the children of the chapel that performed there from 1600 until 1608 was in part due to royal patronage, which led to a vogue for the child plays. Music as an integral and ancillary part of the entertainment was certainly impressed, being remarked upon in the well-known observation by a German visitor, Friedrich Geshov, to the Blackfriars in 1602. Now he goes to the play, he sees that on the stage, before the play starts, there is a performance, and he mentions the instruments that the boys have. They have 
an exquisite concert of organs, lutes, bandoras, mandoras, bowed strings, woodwinds, such as this time, when a boy sang so beautifully in a warbling voice to a bass viol that unless the nuns in Milan may have outdone him, we didn't hear the like on our travels. So obviously very impressed. The instruments described here form the constituents of what was re referred to as the consort in early modern England, and nowadays commonly known as the broken consort, broken meaning whole, not whole, a mixed consort of different instruments. This specifically defined group of lute, treble viol, later violin, bass viol, sitten, bandora, and flute or recorder was apparently popular at the English court and is to be found used in plays from as early as 1566. <clears throat> Intriguingly, in 1599, Thomas Morley, composer, singer, theorist and publisher, published his first book of consort lessons for this very ensemble and dedicated it to the careful handling of the weights of the City of London. He called them the excellent and expert musicians. Whilst there's no evidence <clears throat> of a direct link between this publication and the music played in the Blackfriars Playhouse, the fact that the, a consort is playing there in 1602 and there is a link to the consort and theatre stretching back several decades, it's tempting to suggest and suppose that Morley's motivation in dedicating the consort lessons to the weights is because they had already established themselves as the players of this repertoire. Gershaw's account uh, implies that it was the boys who provided this concert before the play, but it's not explicit, and the possibility is there that the weights, or at least some of their number, were playing on stage as well that day. In addition to the Morley publication, at least one other source of consort music survives in printed form from the early 17th century that may well have direct connection with theatre performance. Philip Rossiter was a court lutenist and is significant in that of those who produced the surviving broken consort books, he has the clearest line of contact with the theat theatrical world of the time. In 1609, the same year that he published his own con Lessons for Consort, Rossiter, along with the, a goldsmith, Robert Kisa, became associated with the man management of a company of boys actors, the children of Whitefriars, later renamed the Children of the Queens, based at Whitefriars Theatre. <clears throat> Rossiter's publication of his Lessons for Consort in the same year that he took over management of a boys' company, if not designed, certainly seems fortuitously coincidental. The instruments of the consort all fall within the soft instrument category, therefore acceptable for those to play for whom music is not their occupation. There are frequent references to, con to a consort playing in Elizabethan and Jacobean plays. So this, coupled with the concrete evidence that two apprentice actors were left, a bass file, a sitten, bandora and lute in the will of the actor Augustine Phillips in 1605, could well suggest that the consort was an ensemble suited to both professional and the actor musicians alike. So, from within the plays themselves is to be found more evidence that the consort was well established as a theatre band by the 1580s. Associated at first with royal entertainment, as were the boys' companies, noble households, and then in the private and public playhouses. In Thomas Decker's Old Fortunatus of 1599, performed by the Admiral's men at the Rose Theatre, Shadow enters. So you can see here the delicate warble, delicious strings and heavenly wire drawers must surely be the broken consort again, flute, viols and lute, and the metal strung sitten and bandora. Again, in Anthony Monday's translation of an Italian play, The Two Italian Gentlemen of 1586, we find <coughs> the consort sounding a pleasant galio, sounding again. They play a solemn dump, and then the consort soundeth a pleasant alamein at the end of each of the acts. Things become a little less clear when 
and the other instruments called for in Playtex are taken into consideration. In the surviving prints that contain more than basic instructions for the music required in the performances, there are often examples of the use of several different kinds of instruments. One significant fact that has not been considered until now is that the instruments called for are often those as commonly men get their living with, as Cleland put it, the instruments of the occupational, professional musician. These include hoboys, which are shawms, a reed instrument, cornet, sackbutt, trumpets, fife and drums. The Waits in London had successfully petitioned to effectively control the employment of musicians in the city and its environs in the late 1500s. This certainly included theatre work when offered, which it certainly was, as we know, not from a play text actually, but in the form of an official complaint in 1613, which states that the Waits failed to turn up for the wedding of a magistrate's daughter because they had instead taken on perhaps more lucrative employment in a public theatre. In 1634, Preparations for a mask and its preceding procession made note of the band of the Blackfriars Playhouse, who the organiser, Bulstrode Whitlock, hoped to employ. They were John Adson, Ambrose Bieland, Henry Field, Thomas Hutton, Francis Parker and Ralph Strachey. All these musicians were established and experienced multi-instrumentalists, playing on an impressive variety of wind and strings, and quite possibly more than those recorded here. They would have been the ideal musicians to embrace the provision of music to accompany different seeds, scenes, moods and dramatic events in a play. Thus a broad palette of instrumental colours was available from the six players, such as at the Blackfriars. In the tragedy of Tancred and Gismond in 1591, a play presented by the gentlemen of the Inns of Court, there's a description of the music heard between the acts. So before the second act, there was heard a sweet noise of still pipes. Before the act, act three, the hoboys, the hoboys, played, sounded a lofty almen. Before act four, there was heard a consort of sweet music. And before act five was a dead march played. Recorders, shawms, probably sackba, and a mixed consort, all used with a variety of different styles and textures. Of particular interest, is the number and variety of instruments that could be cued, sometimes occurring within a matter of a few lines. For example, in Rowley's When You See Me, You Know Me in 1605, we have, character Ty says, uh, give breath to your loud tuned instruments, and loud music is cued. And then there's some discourse upon the actual uh, nature of music. And then we have soft music called for. And finally, at the end, a song is asked for. First, loud music is called for, presumably cornets and hoboys and sackbuts perhaps. Six lines later, soft music on recorders or consort followed by a song, with or without instrumental accompaniment. In order for this to be ex executed smoothly, either different ensembles of instrumentalists were required, or a band who were able to double on loud and soft wind as well as bowed and plucked strings. The actors themselves may well have provided some sort of some of the soft music and singing but the loud music would have been played by the weights and if they fulfilled that role then it would be logical to then exploit the full range of their versatility. Other evidence exists within playtext to support the likely employment of the Waits. For example, in the book of Sir Thomas More, 1595, the Waits play Enter Lord's Mayor. And in Lord Mayor, uh, and in Thomas Haywood's If You Know Not Me, Part 2, there's a cue that says Enter the Waits in Sergeant's Gowns. And in Robert Armin's The History of the Two Maids of Morclac in 1609, we have what are the weights of London come? A yes, sir. Play in their highest key then. Hoboys play. Sound hoboys. Bit of a misalignment of the cue there, but we can see what's intended. Violins were very much in vogue by 
the early 17th century. Yet again were instruments played by the occupational professional and not the recreational amateur musician. Progressing further into the century, references to fiddlers become more frequent in the text and rubric of dramas, both in those performed at indoor playhouses, but also in the open space of the Globe Theatre, belying the oft-stated assertion that strings and open-air theatres didn't mix. So, by identifying the instrumental cues and noting their proximity to each other in the play, and then matching this information with the conventional hierarchy of instrumental practice, I suggest that it is possible to identify with greater clarity, perhaps, particular types and status of musicians playing in the principal theatres in early modern London, and the various paths that led them to be part of this thriving culture. Thank you. It was terrific. I hope everyone can hear me. That was uh, really fascinating. And I can tell uh, by the way you gave that short lecture that you uh, had millions of things you could probably have told us beyond that. And I hope our paths will cross again. And we're absolutely delighted that you could bring your uh, high flown expertise to the De Vere Society. Very honored by it too. Thank you very much. Uh, we turn now to what I personally considered to be one of Shakespeare's most beautiful utterances. That's Lorenzo's speech to Jessica about the musica universalis, yeah. or the music of the spheres from Merchant of Venice, read for us by Derek Jacobi. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Seat, Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patterns of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou behold'st, but in his motion, like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubims. Such harmony is in immortal souls. But whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Thank you, Derek, and it does not get more beautiful than that. Now uh, for something a little more offbeat, which concerns the comic actor Will Kemp, derided in his day for his pettiness and boastfulness, who wrote a book called Nine Days Wonder to convince a disbelieving public that he really had danced all the way from London to Norwich. The book is known to Oxfordians because it contains a comic allusion to Macbeth and was published in 1600, which of course sends a wrecking ball through the modern Stratfordian dating system. Here to tell you more about uh, Will Kemp and Nine Days Wonder is Claire Salomon and his Society of Strange and Ancient Instruments. Welcome. Who was Will Kemp? Well, that's a good question. He was a famous individual at the time of Shakespeare's theatre. He was one of those artists that went off on a tangent and must have really annoyed his fellow actors who were trying to stick to the script. Maybe he wore out his welcome and was eventually evicted from the, from the Globe or from the Shakespeare's company. In order to keep his career going, he, he danced to Norwich. He's going to dance the marathon, and he's going to donate the money to Kemp.
Will Kemp was the most famous clown or comic actor at the end of the 16th century and he worked with the very famous playwright Will Shakespeare in the company of the Chamberlain's men. Will Kemp was what we call a physical comic. He had a routine which involved a lot of dancing and the audience loved his dances and his jigs. And his jig was a kind of play danced to a Morris dance. And when he left the Chamberlain's men, in order to make some money to keep his career afloat, he embarked upon a journey dancing from London to Norwich, which became known and printed as his Nine Days Wonder. We think of the publicity stunt as a very modern phenomena, but actually it's rather delightful to find that it was going on 400 years ago, and this is exactly what Nine Days Wonder was. The beauty of taking Nine Days Wonder as the inspiration for this piece is that we're able to explore secular music, songs and dance from right across Elizabethan society. In Elizabethan and Jacobean times, uh, many people would have instruments in their house and a very normal way to have an entertainment in the evening is to go to your instrument chest and take out what's in there and play the music that you've got to hand. So uh, we find tunes from these times uh, arranged for virginals, which are little keyboard instruments, arranged for vile consort and for mixed consort. So this is absolutely perfect for our group where we have an incredible array of rather peculiar instruments. And so we're taking very much the same approach, taking the tunes from these times and enjoying playing them, getting them to work with the sounds that we have. A modern Elizabethan jig well, back then, at the end of the main play, somewhere like the Globe, the clowns would come back on after the curtain call and present some little knockabout comedy play with music and jokes and bawdiness and playing off the audience. This is what I've attempted to do, to write a short modern verse playlet with um, rhyming couplets and songs. So I took as my starting point for this, an inspiration for this, um, William Kemp's famous falling out with Shakespeare. He left Shakespeare's company, and that was part of why he said, I'm going to do my big walk to Norwich. So I have put it into the present day, and I have two guys called William, one Will Kemp, one Will Shakespeare, and they are descendants of those two famous guys, and there is an antagonism there between them. Four hundred years ago, the audiences would have been much more used to this kind of thing at the end of their performance. Uh, this is a principally a music-loving audience. We hope that they will embrace the spirit in which it is offered, which is that of fun and raucous daftness.
Well, a thank you to Stephen Player, Claire Salomon, and the Society of Strange and Ancient Instruments. Um, I, I, I would recommend, I don't know if people have read this book, but it, it, the, the book he's talking about, uh, called Nine Days Wonder. I think probably there's a little bit more to it than, than even they're letting out there. I don't think it's quite as simple as the story appears to be. So, for instance, in this book, he starts off by saying, why is everybody lying about me? Why do they think I didn't dance all the way from London to Norwich? And he talks quite a lot of rubbish, and it's a very easily mockable book, uh, which in fact is mocked, I think, in, um, in, in the Parnassus plays. Uh, but it, it's very, very fascinating, and I would recommend, it's a short book, I'd, re I'd recommend you read it, if for no other purpose, but to see how uh, silly, parsimonious and pompous Kemp could be. And interesting enough, um, we had a little, um, I read a poem, if you remember, earlier this evening, uh, coming from Romeo and Juliet. And I did, what I didn't say then is, in the first folio, it says just in front of it, enter Kemp. The traditional view of that is that... Uh, uh, that Kemp played that part or something like that, and they accidentally dropped it into the first folio. I, I would hazard a guess that there's a big, bit of mocking of Kemp is actually going on there, uh, because we go straight into that speech about the silver sound. What is a silver sound all about? What does that mean? Oh, it's about getting money for music. So I think there's, there's mocking of the players there and their mercenary ways through Kemp, but that's for another time. We are now going to have uh, 20 minutes of questions and answers, and very much hope uh, that all will be encouraged to participate by posting your questions to the panel, which you can do by clicking on the Q&A thingamy at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, you can ask us about anything and be as rude or as forthright or as polite or whatever you wish. So fire away. If by some misfortune we run out of time, I think actually we're, we're ahead of time, so we probably won't. But if that should happen before your question gets addressed, uh, then our discourses will be continued on the members forum at the De Vere Society website at devesociety.co.uk. Now, I think Rosemary um, is putting the questions to us. So do we have a question? Rosemary. Um, hello, Alexander, um, and hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from Dublin. Um, so to get the ball rolling, I'm going to uh, put a question to Howard. Um, Howard, Shakespeare seems to have combined elements of Commedia dell'arte and Commedia erudita in his plays. And why do you think that is? And who were the different audiences that he was appealing to? in the one performance well i don't i mean i'm i'm kind of quite new to the whole shakespeare uh, yeah. um i i think why he drew those i'm i'm for a while in working with canadian commedia i saw a connection between shakespeare and commedia having now started to look into it more i i'm very much of the opinion that de Vere was shakespeare and that he went and in his time in Italy, he would have been in the courts and in the streets. He would have been seeing these different plays, uh, <clears throat> bringing that style back into his own uh, writing. And uh, I think yeah. the, the two are kind of at different levels. They are, I think, Commedia dell'arte, which was much m not actually just of the streets, but combined street and the erudita. But there were two different audiences. And if you look at the plays of Shakespeare, you look at the globe, you know, you've got the, the uh, more well-off sitting at the back and you've got the groundlings at the front and the plays play out to all of those audiences. They, they seem to be able to picture all of these different audiences and it's what makes them so inclusive. And I think it's what makes Commedia inclusive is it, it was, it's pitched at, I mean, Commedia particularly is pitched at as many audiences as you can get because you're, you're, passing the hat round very often so you're trying to to be able to play to anywhere and you will adapt your play to what your audience is and it's, it's set up to do that so I suspect that De Vere took that knowledge and that and took it into the writing of these plays does that, I think that answers it 
Kevin, I think, had his hand up to answer. Speaking to that, I think. Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, fantastic talk there, Howard. Absolutely brilliant. I wish we could hear a lot more from you. Um, I did give an outline in Great Oxford about the Commedia d'arte and the influence on Shakespeare. Um, if we're going to accept Edward de Vere as the author, then almost certainly he, he witnessed the Commedia in Italy. But I don't think it was just in public, in, in ordinary theatres, um, sort of ordinary piazzas and, and streets. I think it was actually in houses uh, belonging to the rich. And the, the, the comedians would come in and they would perform there for the people in the rich houses as well as out on the streets. Uh, it reminds me of a, a Peruvian band. I once paid a lot of money to go and see in Blandford Forum. And then earlier in the afternoon, they were actually playing on the streets as well. Exactly the same music that I saw in the theatre a bit later on. So I think these, these comedian people were able to, to play in both. And what they had was this huge repertoire of lazies, as you said, these small little scenes, the scenarios, which is a sort of bigger outlines, and they could improvise and adapt them to whichever audience they had. And I'm sure that whoever watched it, you know, who, who came to write Shakespeare, was absolutely enamored of all these, would have seen and talked to them um, as, as much as possible. So when it comes to actually writing them up, though, these things are being sort of held for posterity. So I imagine that what we've, we're going from is like, as you said, the jazz musicians at the beginning who are then performing it as a sort of set piece at, at the end. Um, so I, I don't see that there's any sort of huge, great distinction between the Commedia dell'arte and the Commedia erudita, except for the fact that it's probably written down at the end. <clears throat> so the, the, the distinction as we normally understand it is that erudita, yeah, was, was meant to be read in a bit more intellectual, a bit more referencing the classics or something like that, is that? Um, I think it definitely did, but I think that that's according to who the audience is, is uh, at the beginning. If you um, think about the players who come to Elsinore and perform uh, in front of Claudius and in front of Hamlet, they, they've got a wide repertoire of things that they can do. So they can perform at a lower level as well as at a higher level. Uh, but I think what what Shakespeare, what Edward de Vere has done is he's taken these scenari, these Lazzi, and he's put them into place, which is then written down. So what he's done is he's used the origins of the Committee of Arte, and then he's put it down in, into the erudita form. Yeah. Uh, Jan Schaefer and um, the late Ron Hess, they, they had a very, very interesting paper in Oakland a few years ago about that. So uh, I, th I think that must be somewhere. Yes, J just one thing to say about Veer, which is um, often forgotten, well, certainly by his detractors, is that he went to Italy uh, 1575 to 76. He didn't go simply to go on holiday, to lounge around, to have fun. Uh, he went there uh, as, uh, on, on a mission, really, to discover what he could discover about educators, about scholars. And it seems very likely that he looked very, very carefully at the theatre, because that was something he was very interested in, with a specific view to coming back and altering the course of British theatre. And of course, it was just after he returned that the two first theatres uh, were erected, the um, curtain and the one known as the theatre. Now, I know Kevin uh, believes that the Lord, the unnamed Lord that appears in, in a manuscript, uh, who is said to have built one of those theatres, uh, Kevin thinks it's Leicester. Uh, I think it's probably Oxford, but it's tantalising. We don't really know which one it was. There's a very interesting poem, which is deep and difficult and only four lines long, dedicated to Roscius, um, to uh, Alan, Ed, uh, Edward Allen, the actor, by Weaver. And if you read it very carefully, and if you connect it to what has been written in the a poem immediately before it, which is addressed to William Shakespeare, uh, you can tell that what he's really saying is that this stuff all came back from Italy and it came back uh, from the same person who was William Shakespeare. But that's for another time analysing those two poems, but they are absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree there, Alexander. Um, I, but one thing I, I would like to point out is that a couple of Shakespeare's tragedies are really comedies that have gone wrong. So Romeo and Juliet would be a play ordinarily where uh, the 
the, the lead characters don't die, where they, they manage to escape. And, and if you look at a lot of those figures, exactly as Howard said, they are, they are the stock figures of the Commedia dell'arte. And really, it's the same with Othello. So it's, it's a very similar situation where, unfortunately, it all goes wrong. That, they, that, that Shakespeare, the creative mind, has imposed on it a tragic tale, as opposed to this original one. Uh, I loved what Howard said about having the sort of two houses on either side and, and being so different. I think that's absolutely terrific. And uh, those improvisations that you were able to do there, Howard, fantastic. So I'd love to hear a lot more about that. Anyway, thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Howard. Can I just speak in, into that a little bit, what <clears throat> uh, Alexander was saying, that for me, working in comedy, one of the things you find about it is it has such knowledge of theatre has knowledge of narrative, knowledge of character, knowledge of set, knowledge of the theatre stage space itself. So that makes a lot of sense to me that someone's gone and studied this form and brought this knowledge of not just playwriting, but theatre back to the Elizabethan court and created this amazing, these amazing works that have stood the test of time. Am I on here too, Alexander? You are yeah. indeed, yep. Yes. I. Uh... I wanted to play off something that Kevin was mentioning um, about Othello. <coughs> One of the most extraordinary to me uh, talks that I ever listened to was uh, by Richard Whalen and Rendrea quite a long time ago, um, indicating that Othello, they had found uh, that the underpinnings of the characters were from the Commedia. Uh, the, the, uh, the guy who steals the father's daughter and their, their angry father and the Iago character as well, speaking to the audience, if you will. Um, it, it's more detailed than I have the, the memory of, but the whole extraordinary idea that, he, that Oxford would have brought the underpinnings of uh, what we think of as exaggerated character into a tragedy like a fellow and used it as the opening of his uh his structure uh is extraordinary that's all i can tell you about that yes um rosemary i have some are, are more questions coming in because i think the best thing is if if we just have a gentle thoughtful stop like we did just then and you've got another question just barge straight in with it perfect um yes the questions are coming in thick and fast so i'm going to put two of them to you um alexander uh one is from cheryl egan donovan she would like to know have you any um projects at the moment and if you could perhaps speak a little bit about that and um also um from shelley maycock as to whether Great Oxford, which of course is the, the book of essays uh, published by the De Beers Society, um, whether that is going to be reprinted. Um, yes, I, I can answer both those questions. Um, firstly, the projects I'm involved with at the moment, uh, quite apart from uh, the work we're doing with the De Beers Society. Um, I know this has been going on for a very long time and people know about it and they're getting itchy and irritated. Uh, that it's taken quite so long, but it just means it's going to be better and better when it comes out. There's a lot of tinkering and correcting. I'm talking about the two-volume uh, Shakespeare allusion book, which I have co-edited, mm -hmm. written uh, with Roger Stripmatter. And that, I think, uh, will... Well, I don't want to be conceited, but I, I really do think it'll be a, a turning point in the whole Oxfordian argument. Uh, what it does is to take the allusions to William Shakespeare, contemporary allusions, running from 1593, when that name first appears in print, uh, through to the, uh, uh, well, uh, really very, very solidly indeed to 1642, uh, and then slightly more chosen after that, but really everyone you've got. And, and why I think this is such a spectacularly interesting book um, is because as I was working on it, and as Roger was working on it, we came to realize that every single contemporary commentator writing about William Shakespeare knew perfectly well that it was a pseudonym and that it was a pseudonym being used 
by Edward de Vere. Now, we've had quite a lot of discussion of some of these individual allusions before, but to put the whole lot together all in one place and to see that every single person knew it, uh, but they were all sort of playing slight games of, of nod, nod, wink, wink. Uh, so that's, uh, I really, really hope, will be in public publication form uh, within, I don't know, five, six months. We're still just doing the last corrections. Um, I have another project which I'm working on at the moment, uh, which is a drama. It's, it's, it's a script, uh, a, a, a biopic of Edward de Vere. Um, I think most people will have looked him up on Wikipedia when it gets going, so they'll probably know uh, that he's a candidate for William Shakespeare. But in fact, if you don't do that, uh, you'll get as far, I think, as episode six or I think maybe episode seven, uh, when you realise he is... William Shakespeare. And I think this is a, a, a really, really uh, fascinating project and I'm very grateful uh, to certain people who've put a lot of encouragement behind me to get on with this and, and, and do it. Um, why it's so fascinating? Well, we all know that Edward de Vere did have an incredibly interesting life. Uh, I mean, everything in it from swashbuckling to um, uh, trouble with women to bankruptcy uh, to this absolutely extraordinary talent which people praised him for. Um, it starts in 1572, the great debacle over the execution of his friend and his mentor, the Duke of Norfolk. And you'll probably remember that he goes and petitions the Queen and petitions uh, Leicester and, um, and Burley, his father-in-law, to try and stop this execution from happening. And he even devises a rescue plan to get him out of the tower. And why that's a very important time for Edward de Vere, and he's 22 years old, he's literally only just got married, but it's a very important time for him indeed, because uh, when, when Norfolk does get executed, the, the Queen delays it and delays it, but she does chop his head off eventually, and he feels this terrible sense of betrayal, not least betrayal of his father-in-law of Burley, who he feels uh, connived actually in the downfall of Norfolk. Norfolk was so important to him, although he was a little bit older, um, he, he, he was actually the executor of his will and so was Leicester. Leicester entirely benefited from that will and one feels that a lot of Veer's financial problems were kicked off uh, by the way that his estates were pretty well fleeced by Leicester. And I don't have proof of this, but I suspect that Norfolk uh, very much stuck up for, for Veer, and that's why he felt so strongly about it. So that's the starting point. And then it goes through nine episodes, and we'll finish in a rather uh, a strange and philosophical way in episode nine, where we're left really with the Queen uh, close to her death, uh, Edward de Vere close to his death, and the figure of John Dee, the old man, um, who brings so much of the philosophy uh, that we see in Shakespeare. And so those three will end it. And the whole thing is structured on three times three, something I was talking about a little bit when I was looking at that, that bird's mm -hmm. setting of my mind to me, a kingdom is. And three times three is really the key, I think, to opening up a lot of mysteries in the Elizabethan age. There's that wonderful, uh, well, people think it's just a purely comic moment that happens in Love's Labour's Lost when uh, Costard is told thrice three is nine and he says not so sir we know what we know well there is a great secret that is wrapped up in three times three and it was through that secret through the three times three uh, that I located the uh, burial place final burial place of Edward de Vere which is smack underneath the Shakespeare monument in Westminster Abbey so that's going to be the sort of denouement of this extraordinary uh, 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 program. And it's something I'm very much um, doing at the moment. So I, I, I know that a lot of people very kindly and very nicely follow the uh, videos that I've been putting online and they've probably been wondering why there haven't been many videos going down lately. Well, the reason for that is I've been absolutely in the thick of it trying to write this script, which is, um, I have to say, quite difficult to write in the sense that when it comes to episode six, when we reveal that, that uh, Edward de Vere is Shakespeare, what we really cannot have is everyone saying, oh, what an arse, this man we've just been watching for six episodes, you must be joking, how could he be Shakespeare? So, in other words, I've had to write the script in such a way 
that on the one hand, I don't put people off by making the language too complicated and too replete with these and those, etc. But at the same time, the transition uh, to being this uh, very talented, rather wild courtier into being William Shakespeare is not such a bump that it's that it's not believable. That's been one of the difficulties. Anyway, so to the final part of your question, Rosemary, about the books, the Great Oxford books. Sorry, I say books. Maybe some people don't know there are books. Great Oxford, I think, if I'm correct, Kevin will, will, will correct me if I am, but I think it was published in 2005, quite a long time ago. I'm absolutely amazed by how well that collection of essays has stood the test of time. Um, there's very little in it uh, that needed updating upgrading but I've added a little preface just to say a few things about that but it is going otherwise to be reprinted as it was at first in a beautiful new set and Kevin I'm sure can tell us a, a bit about uh, one of the books that he is uh, editing in that set and the other one is Eddie Jolly who's editing that one so there'll be Great Oxford Volume 1, Great Oxford Volume 2 and Great Oxford Volume 3. They are all pretty well so ready that they're ready to go to the printers. We're going to kick it off as a very beautiful, very attractive, irresistible box set with all three in them um, newly designed uh, by uh, uh, Ralph Walker Smith. And, um, and that will be out very soon. And then for those who, who don't, who have got the first one and really only want uh, the second two volumes, they will be put out as trade editions and I think you'll be able to get them from Amazon. But I think it'd be really great if Kevin would uh, give us a comment or two, because he he was not only chairman of the De Vere Society when that project kicked off, I think, but also he's the editor of, is it volume two, Kevin? Um, thank you, Alexander. Um, yes. Sorry, can, can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> great Oxford One is being reprinted, as you say, virtue as it stands. And, and you're right, it, it, has, it has stood the test of time. And then a few years ago, we got together, so Eddie Jolly and Elizabeth Emily and myself, and we collected the best essays that we've we have found from the succeeding years, and we put them into two more volumes. Eddie Jolly has edited the second one, and that's more of an argument as to why not the man from Stratford and what it is that makes us believe in, in the, the man from Castle Headingham. And uh, there are quite a few reviews in that one, so that might be a useful one to give to people who are new to it. And then the third one, which is the one that I've edited, so we're referring to it as GO3, uh, involves a, a wider range of things about Edward de Vere and his life and, and his interests. Um, the, the one about Edward de Vere's music is actually Elizabeth Emily, that's going to be in the second one. So I think they are pretty much ready to go, and they should be available in a beautiful box set. And uh, hopefully that we'll be seeing those very soon, and uh, with all the terrific designs that Ralph has done. So. Uh, but I'm, I'm just also thinking, Alexander, the, the wonderful illusion book that you've got in preparation. And I've got my two volumes here that I use. Um, so the sort of strap forwarding ones from 1931. And I'm absolutely dying to go and just substitute your new ones in and put those on my shelf there. So yes, a lot of exciting publishing problems going on. Uh, if William is still there, William Lyons, um, I, I would like to just pass over a completely different question to him to, to sort of anticipate Rosemary. Is William, when you were involved in the Globe, at what stage did you get involved with the music? Was it very early on or halfway through or five minutes before yeah, the. I, I, yeah, hi. Um, I, start, I first came in in 1998, so very, very soon after the opening. In fact, pouring rain playing in a very muddy building site for the uh, laying ceremony there in 1996 I think it was so yeah right from the very beginning and um, I started playing in the I was uh, uh, writing and, and musical director from about 2000 until uh, 2015 when uh, they stopped doing historical plays <laughs> I stopped working there, but also I worked as a composer on different plays. So yeah, from from the beginning, really, with Mark uh, Mark Rylands. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have a question here um, for Howard, and it's from Jeremy Price. And 
he's wondering, Howard, if you could speak a little bit um, to the notion of the improvisation and how that eventually contributed to what, what we have in the, in the written down form now. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, the improvised, comedy was improvised form. So what, what, what I've talked about is uh, these Latsy and it wasn't, when you think of improvisation, it's not just, you can't just go and improvise completely uh, every night making something new up. I think of it much more in that kind of jazz way that they, that there were, uh, with that scenario, you would go on and you would, you would have keywords that would key other actors into known kind of text or known little bits of um, script that would have happened. There would have been very clearly choreographed music bits and dance bits because you can't improvise those things. So I kind of, I've, I've always seen it more as there's kind of islands that you know are going to happen and how you get between those islands, that's the bit that you improvise. And that improvisation will depend on the audience, depend on how you're feeling at that time. I suspect that probably, I mean, just from a theatrical point of view, if you're working with playwrights uh, and you, you know, you're a playwright's working up a play, you very often get up as an actor and you improvise and the playwright will then take maybe one line or one word or one idea from that. And then they will go away and work on that. So I worked with Peter Oswald, who actually was a writer in residence at the Globe when Mark Rylance was there. Um, and we work in that way, where we'll kind of improvise something and then Peter will go away and just write a play from that. So I think there's elements that, that a playwright would work with a company. It's another thing I find very interesting about De Vere, that as I understand it, he had theatre companies un, under him, I think, uh, as I understand. He, he was sort of in charge of that, in charge of a whole kind of coterie of writers. That This way of, of kind of working between improvising and then writing and then giving that to the actors and then seeing what comes from that so it's a it can be that writing and acting a very two-way process when you're working with a, a writer uh, in terms of commedia you know it was first written down kind of goldoni was the first to i think to kind of structure commedia as commedia in, in writing so i would think that you know de Vere, when he came back would have worked with people to to improvise and get get ideas and themes and then go away and write um you know how how they these wonderful bits of poetry so they they wouldn't have been improvised in that way but they might well have come from some some of these erudita poems these poems that were looking back to roman and greek um, drama in the renaissance that there might well have been elements of some of the themes in that that he could have picked up from the courts in italy um thanks thanks very much um howard um i have a question here for um william um do you think that the globe should return to the performance of the shakespeare plays in the historical context <laughs> Me. Yes. Well, uh, <laughs> that's not really for me to say. I mean, obviously, it was set up uh, 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 with the one of the sort of founding tenets uh, that it should encourage new writing and new new plays, as well as present historic uh, historical versions of the original um, late sixteenth and seventeenth century plays, and uh, um, that. That hasn't happened uh, for a, for a while. The, the latter, the new the new plays are great, uh, and, and uh, the theatre space is just as good and just as we were from the very beginning. Uh, I just think it's it's something of a um, of a challenge to to people who who don't who see historical performance and and the joy you can get from it. They see that as something as a challenge or even a, a, a block, a hindrance to to to, to theatrical expression and. and um, interpretation. Obviously that's not the case and it wasn't for Mark Rylance and it wasn't for Tim Carroll, the great director who, who, who collaborated with Mark a lot and, um, uh, and like Howard mentioned, you know, obviously t um, Peter Oswald, who I know uh, well from the Globe and from other things, his new writing blended perfectly with the, with the old style, uh, the, the earlier theatrical pieces as well so there was a, a wonderful sort of synthesis and a meeting there and that 
uh, unfortunately hasn't been embraced by um, uh, recent artistic directors. So yeah, it would be lovely if it did, but um, I, I don't see it happening uh, whilst the, 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 the upper echelons aren't embracing the uh, historical performance. Um, that's great. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, William. Um, I have a few questions here for Derek, but he's not on the on the panel for Q&A. So um, I'm going to skip to a question, which perhaps, Alexander, you might be best placed to answer. Uh, my, my apologies, Rosemary. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Derek is. Yes, he is on the Q&A. He is available. Oh, he is on the Q&A. OK. Oh, one second. Please, please. I'm fascinated by what's being said. <laughs> I don't want to speak. I want to listen and learn. I've had my moment. I wanted to ask Derek about about the globe and whether he has, well, just anything he, he would care to say about the globe as as a particularly as a Shakespeare space. Well, I've never um, worked there um, apart from the fact that very early on when they were building the place, a group of actors were asked to go and test the acoustics. So I stood on the stage with various other actors and. Um, acted my socks off, and apparently the acoustics were wonderful. Um, I've since, of course, visited the Globe and seen plays there. I, I feel often for the actors working there. I don't think it's easy to work um, in that space and with uh, those audiences. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure, and I. I think. I, I mean, I haven't been there. Um, lately, uh, the, the, I think uh, uh, Mark was still in charge the last time I went, and I thought his contribution to the Globe was absolutely wonderful, wonderful. And I'd worked with Mark, he played Ariel to my Prospero many, many years ago, um, and he, is, he was a perfect choice to run that, that building, that theatre, absolutely. But my, my, con my contact with the globe itself has been fairly peripheral. Um, really, the old Vic is, is my stamping ground, um, where I was there for seven years when it was the original National Theatre. So all my memories really are not uh, globe orientated, they're old Vic orientated. They're not globular. It's yeah, not globular, no. The thing about the, thing about the globe is it, is it does raise some quite interesting questions. And I know Oxfordians are, are constantly wrestling with the, and some Stratfordian scholars too, with the question of whether these Shakespeare plays were actually fundamentally written to be performed primarily at court, uh, probably indoors in front of the courtiers, and then either in Baudelarized form or in some sort of licensed form are then allowed to have their performances at the Globe. And of course, in, in the Oxfordian story, the Globe is, is, is quite interesting because of course it's quite late. Oxford dies in 1603 and the Globe isn't erected until 1599, uh, taken from the, the timbers of the previous, uh, of the theatre. And uh, so, so the question is, for Oxfordians at least, what, what, what is the connection between Oxford and the Globe, well, we know that his father-in-law was the kind of boss of the Burbages, so he's all pretty close to it, but we, it's, it's, it's tantalising that we can't quite uh, make that contact as the, the Stratfordian army uh, continues rather jollily calling it Shakespeare's Globe. Uh, but there's lots, I think, still, I hope there's lots still to be discovered about this. Kevin, I think you were... You were um, um, yeah, my... My very first meeting of the Devere Society was in January 1998, when uh, we were lucky enough to have the director of the Globe come along and talk to us about it. I didn't know who he was, uh, a funny little man with a hat and with walking boots, and it turned out to be Mark Rylance, who's ever so interesting. And I think, Derek, you were there as well. Was and, I? Uh, so, we, yeah, we went on stage. I think, Richard, um, I think Richard was there as well. And one of the things that Mark said was that... Uh, Exactly as, as Howard said, that you've got these sort of main points, you want to get from A to C, but you've got slightly different routes. And he, he encouraged the actors to just take a little bit of responsibility and, and to move that way or this way in getting from one to another. And so there was a sort of a small amount of improvisation rather than sort of just doing something spontaneously stupid off the top of their heads. Um, I, 
I, I just saw a note there from Annabelle saying how difficult it is to, to act in the globe. And one of the things that I felt I noticed about Mark, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, is that quite often in Shakespeare, you get the same sentiment expressed in two different ways. And what Mark seemed to do, and perhaps some of the other actors, maybe it's just my imagination, was they'd sweep off one side saying this, and then they'd sweep off the other side saying that. So that if you were at the side, one way or another, you'd get sentiment, even if you'd missed part of it because it was over there, or there's a helicopter hovering overhead trying to sort of catch a sort of free view of what's going on. Yes, well, it's often uh, difficult when you're playing in the virtual round, you must always remember that um, the audience is not only in front of you, they're on both sides. It's like playing at Chichester. Um, you have to be very conscious that the audience is wrapped around you. And uh, so that it's not only to get up there and to get down there, but to get there and there. And so um, you do have to pepper it around quite a lot, but, but at the same time, making it logical and real. One um, of the other things I, I remember, sorry Rosemary, but just to say uh, to William Lyons, I, I didn't realise how important you were in, in this early globe, but how, how marvellous the music was, that it was definitely worthwhile to arrive at seven o'clock and, and to listen to the musicians and to stay there during the interval and, and to listen to them again, because here you had a, a free concert, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, so anyway, so thank you, thanks to all. And uh, so, yes, Derek, I have seen you perform at the Globe, even if it was just a few words. <laughs> and Richard. Yeah, I have to say, I, I was at that very, very uh, thing when we were testing the Globe out. And they did have, they did come to a decision that the pillars needed to be reduced because they hid so many of the actors from so many of the audience. That's right. Uh, so they had to do that. And I, uh, going back actually to what Alexander said about the plays being done at court and then maybe being burglarized and being put on stage, the complexity of some of the language is so great that if you miss some of it, you might miss something very important. So it was quite difficult for uh, an audience to keep um, uh, keep concentrating and listening. So Mark's idea of moving something from one way and then back, he had the ability to choose what he would say to which side of the audience or which <laughs> group of the audience. Because I know as an actor that when you turn upstage, your voice disappears. And certainly on the Globe stage, you had to be very careful that people didn't miss some of what you said, yeah. because you turn away from an audience and you disappear. Um, thank you. Um, just still on the subject of performance, um, Hank, can I ask you a question here? Um, if you could maybe unmute yourself. Um, thanks, yeah. Hank. Um, so. The, the, in the context of an actor performing where they are informed by Oxford being the author behind the name Shakespeare, how do you think that affects the actor's performance? Well, I think that uh, it, it, it affects it internally. Um, and this is true of why we're seeking the authorship in the first place. Uh, let me start my video then. My host is asking me. There we are. Um, the, uh, the great writers and the great actors, I believe, no matter what technique they use on the outside, are, are coming from a personal place, a personal engine, if you will, that informs the writing and informs the acting. And it's based on experience. It's based on your own character, uh, your own person. And, and uh, the more you know about Oxford, the more you know about the, the life that he lived in all the various ways that Alexander was talking about. Uh, you combine it all in yourself when you're, you're looking at the various scenes that you want to play. Uh, and you internalize it. And I think that's how it helps. Um, because for years, I couldn't um, answer that question. 
very well. What does it matter to know who wrote this play if I'm acting in it? And that's the best answer I can give. It matters personally, internally, to, 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 to marry your person, personal engine with what you feel about Oxford. That's, that's the best I can come up with. I don't know if anybody else can. Yes, I, I, I agree with you, Hank, that it really does matter. And in the, um, the, the script, the, this sort of whatever it's going to be, HBO, Netflix script that I'm writing, I've, I've dedicated a whole episode to the performance and rehearsals of Hamlet. And what we're going to see there is something really very, very extraordinary, which, of course, Oxfordians uh, can understand, and those who don't understand who wrote these plays can't. And just to look at, well, there are many scenes that's so autobiographical what's going on in that play, but, but I think what will be, come across as extremely exciting is the play within the play, this, this whole idea <laughs> that we have uh, a play set up on the stage, which has been rehearsed by Hamlet himself in order to prick the conscience of, of the king and of the, of the court around. And so there you have Claudius, who, who fits so well the character of, of Leicester, Polonius, who so much mirrors Lord Burley, Oxford's father-in-law, Ophelia, of course, who stands very much for Anne and all that went wrong in that, in that marriage. And the audacity of what really happened at the time, of course, is that you had a layer behind that. So it becomes very Tudor and very meta because you've now actually, in the play that I'm doing, you will have, uh, well, Leicester may just have died, but you will have, um, obviously, the Queen will be in it and, uh, and um, a Burley will be in it. So the embarrassment is not just the players who are embarrassing the characters, uh, Claudius and Polonius, but they're embarrassing the characters upon whom they're based. And I, that's just one of, of, a, of a billion examples we can give of how much, how rich it is mm -hmm. to understand what's really going on when you understand who wrote it and what little games they're playing. Yes, I might add that in, uh, in the play of Hamlet, um, Immediately, the monarch, the king, is aware of who wrote this scene, who wrote the play, if you will, because uh, it's an, almost a self-portrait of Oxford as playwright for the court to catch the conscience of the king. And in his case, often to catch the conscience of the queen, I believe, to inform her about what's going on, to maybe... Uh, prick her into action uh, on different levels, even internationally, perhaps. But uh, the king immediately knows who wrote it, and so did the queen. Now, now so did Burley, so did uh, Lester, and, and uh, up to a certain point in the history here. And uh, that made Oxford very dangerous, and that's what he's portraying in Hamlet. Immediately... Hamlet knows one thing. Now the king knows who, uh, who, that I know what went on, and he wants to kill me, and I better kill him first. And, and that's, that leads us to the, the last part of the play, very dramatically. Who's going to win this battle? Uh, and it all comes about, the high point, imagine, uh, of a playwright putting on a play for those in power, the person in power, to speak truth to power, if you will, uh, and and uh, become dangerous because of it. Um, thank you, thank you, Hank. Um, I have a question here. It's kind of a, a I suppose, a, a philosophical one, uh, suitable for speculation. But um, given it's from Lewis, um, given the invention of opera in 1639, um, and especially with Monteverdi, does the panel think that we would have lost? Edward de Beer to opera if he had been born, say, a century uh, later, particularly given, you know, his travelling to Italy, uh, etc. Would we have lost him to opera rather than being the poet and playwright that he was? Um, You're probably right. Um, music just permeates the plays of Shakespeare. 
and 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 he it, it was every uh, on his fingertips. Uh, there there are just so many allusions to instruments and to various musical uh, terminology, not to mention the word music and the word song uh, singing. So uh, he would have evolved as the as the uh, technology and as the uh, stage evolved. I'm sure in today's world he would be one of the great epic directors who knows you know of movies i uh, it's it's hard to tell i think he would avail himself of every technique and and everything that was avail that's available in the time that he lived william oh i was just going to say that opera I mean, it, it, I don't think you could, I'd take issue with the fact someone saying that opera was invented in 1639. Yes, it's me just, too. I think that's, it's, that's not the case. I mean, there were, there were um, types of musical performance going on in Italy uh, towards the end of the 16th century, but no one suddenly woke up one morning and said, wow, yeah, I'm going to invent opera today. <laughs> it's completely different and brand new. Um, what it 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 every it all morphs out of court entertainments, out of ballets, out of intermedi, and out of all all the different structures of of court entertainment. And I I I I certainly agree with Hank that that um, De Vere would have been uh, a major operator uh, in, in perhaps more so in masks. I don't know what there's what the evidence of of his contribution to masks court masks or inns of court masks would have been but i, I imagine because in 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 england op, the idea of what we call opera which was this new style that was adopted uh, was fostered by in in mantua and in other major italian courts uh yes. what it, it wasn't a, it wasn't like it was a new thing because we had the mask here and the mask carried on and on and on uh, right into um just you know up to the restoration almost um and so i i, I would i that's the only i'm just being a bit sort of a bit of a pedant about the opera opera definition that's all yes it's an interesting fact uh, kevin's going to come in in a sec by the way kevin you're on mute so i'll just say this quick point that it's an interesting fact that um uh, most of the poems we have of oxford we know to be by him uh, were published in the Paradise of Dainty Devices, something I mentioned before, in 1576, and they were all described as song lyrics. Um, so it seems that he was um, pretty keen to pump out poetry that would be sung and then give them uh, to this man, uh, Edwards, who was in charge of the Children of the Chapel, uh, probably to be performed on stage, either in, in mask form or something else. Mm. Kevin? Um, yeah, just on masks, I was going to say... They, they really came to the fore under James. Uh, James didn't really like the long plays, and he wasn't really a very sort of literary type of person. And he loved the short masks, especially when he could perform. And there was a great amount of ostentation and ceremony. And Ben Johnson was the great writer of masks. And then with all the designs of Inigo Jones and so on. Um, where's Shakespeare in all this? If William Shakespeare of Stratford was still writing plays, he would have been commandeered to have, have prepared some of these masks. Uh, but we all know that the writer of the Shakespeare canon actually died early on in uh, James's reign, so that therefore he wasn't available to do it. But one of the plays, The, um, the Tempest, I'd just like to say two things, and I'm sure that maybe Derek and others can, can uh, agree or disagree if they like. First of all, they say that there's no <clears throat> origin for it, there's no sort of source for it, but if you look in the Commedia dell'arte, and I've written about this and it's on the website, there is there are three scenarii which are almost exactly the story of Prospero. And what, what um, Shakespeare has done, what Edward de Vere has done, is just to add the sort of backstory to Prospero being exiled from Milan and gain his revenge in, and his restitution. Uh, and secondly, The Tempest really is a, a, a play full of masks, and it's got three of them. And some of them, to my mind, seem really a bit silly, uh, but they're padding out what I think was originally a very short play. There's a very interesting article in the current edition of the Oxfordian, I don't know if you've read it, uh, which suggests that there may have been some influence with a man called Prospero Visconti, who was in Milan at the time, whose family, uh, uh, sorry, in Milan at the time when uh, Oxford went to Milan, and, and whose family uh, anciently held the 
title of Duke of Milan. And he had this absolutely enormous library and that he was robbed, denuded of his title. Um, so there seem to be quite interesting comparisons between Prospero uh, Visconti and, um, and Prospero in, in The Tempest. Um, do we have time for another question, Alexander? Yes, yeah, so the thing is this. Um, we, the, the, con the concert's going to start at seven. And so what we could do is have, have a question or maybe just two more questions. And then if people would like to go off and make themselves a cup of tea or pour themselves a glass of wine and then get back comfortably for the concert, that might be perfect. Great. Um, so I have a question here for um, Derek again, and it's from Jeremy Price. Um, so Derek, uh, Jeremy wants you to speak a little bit about the connection between musical rhythm that is inherent in poetry and how that affects you as an actor in your pace, delivery, um, your pitch, intonation, um, tension, resolution, etc. Wow, that's a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think one, uh, with Shakespeare, um, the, the poetry, the music, is a given. It's in the words and the position of the words and the meaning behind the words. What I try and do whenever I'm uh, playing Shakespeare is to make it accessible. Um, it's it's a, a highly coloured uh, language. It's a language that is, um, to some extent, unfamiliar to large numbers of the audience. I remember, um, you know, going as a, as a schoolboy, a 14 or 15 year old schoolboy being taken to the old Vic and really not understanding very much. Um, so much of it was over my head, words I did, I'd never heard of. Um, and I think for me as, as the actor, it is to um, forget about rhythm, Forget about the music, go for the sense. And because the plays are so extraordinary, so extraordinarily beautifully written, go for what you're trying to say. Go for trying to express your feelings and your thoughts. And if that somehow goes against the rhythm sometimes, but makes what you're saying immediately accessible to the audience, who are not, many of whom are not familiar with Shakespeare, that, that for me is the way to go. And earlier when, when you were talking about um, uh, De Beer or Shakespeare, ultimately, when you're up there doing it, it doesn't matter who wrote it. It, it, it cannot inform the way you're going to play your part. You play your part as truthfully as you can. Um, and you, you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for, if you've got a lovely house full, a thousand people. People are sitting up there and they're sitting down there. They've got to feel as intimately connected with what's going on as the people who are two feet away. And in, in that sense, the, 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 it's fascinating, the, the, the academic um, adventures that we, we can go on and, and we, the, the minds that we, we dig. And it's wonderful. It's fascinating. But ultimately, if I am honest, it doesn't help me. I'm not talking about every actor. It doesn't help me act the part. Learning the lines, knowing what I'm going to look like, knowing where I am on the stage, know, knowing exactly what I'm feeling. Um, and all that has got to be delivered to them. They've got to feel it all. They've got to understand it all. They've got to think it all because that's what we're doing it for. So ultimately, I, I know I'm sounding um, um, dreadful, but ultimately who wrote the words doesn't inform me as an actor um, how to do it. Fascinating. Thank Sorry. you, Derek. Very interesting and truthful. Rosemary, did you say you had one more question or shall we 
Um, I do have one very interesting question, um, probably for yourself, Alexander. Uh, this question is from Alevi, and um, he wants to know, after having looked at your wonderful videos on YouTube, and also he's looked at Alan Green's book, he's wondering, is there any uh, source material for the relationship between John Dee and the Earl of Oxford? Now, we know there are the references to the correspondences between them. We don't have those correspondences, but he's wondering, is with in the context of the, the hermetic orders that were developing at the time, um, is there any evidence we can show th that there is a relationship between those two figures? So we know that in uh, 1570, when Dee wrote his famous uh, uh, prelude, uh, what do you call it, forward to uh, the Billingsley translation of Euclid, that in that year, uh, Oxford wrote letters praising D. And that tantalizingly is the kind of beginning and end of it. But of course it isn't. It's the end of the documentary trail, but of course it jolly well isn't, because D uh, was such an important figure, very much beloved of Queen Elizabeth, and so very much in and out of the court. We know that Oxford uh, was experimenting with all sorts of uh, magical things, possibly with uh, necromancy uh, and uh, such like, and alchemy. And he would have done that, of course, uh, with Dee, as we know that quite a lot of the other courtiers were surrounding Dee and absolutely fascinated about what he was saying. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, some of the uh, investigations into the hermetic content of Shakespeare, which are really beginning to take off now. And we're beginning to see how uh, so much of this comes out of D. Some, of course, comes from Bruno, who came to the court, the Italian who came to the court in the 1580s. Uh, but I think he and D were, were, were pretty much aligned. And what you seem to find is a, a pan-European group of extraordinary intellectuals who were philosophers, uh, mathematicians, working a bit in alchemy, a bit in uh, magic, in Dee's case with navigation. Uh, they were really all-round uh, players who were getting themselves in a, involved in a rather strange a type of Christianity. Um, Dee was extremely uh, a, a holy, pious man, but he had uh, differences about, for instance, the Trinity, now, we know that Oxford spoke of the Trinity in a way that was considered most gross and discourteous uh, to, to right-thinking Christians. Uh, Bruno, we know, had his head chopped off uh, because of his view about, right, actually, I think he was burned at the stake for his view about the Trinity. Um, and some of them were called atheists. We know that Marlowe was called an atheist. We know that uh, Thomas Tresham, who built that beautiful triangular lodge at Rushton, was called an atheist. And one wonders why they're called atheists when they're such holy men, all these, well, I can't speak for Marlowe so much, but certainly Oxford was uh, uh, constantly being described as pious and holy and someone who liked to go in churches, just as Dee was. But so what were they thinking? What was going on in their heads? They had the view that the Trinity consisted of a three-part Godhead with a fourth part, which was the material world, if you like, man. So it's very slightly pantheistic belief. And that's why Dee is, is so sort of secretive about it. He says in his famous work, the Monas Hieroglyphica, he says uh, the quaternary is concealed within the ternary. And no sooner as he said that, he says, oh God, forgive me uh, for saying something in print that all may read, but only the worthy will understand it. And again, this comes back to what I mentioned earlier of Costa, Freis 3 is 9, not so, sir, we know what we know. And I think once one begins to understand this, this theology, this way of looking things, it, it becomes an extremely useful key uh, to unpicking many of the mysteries, including, of course, the dedication to the sonnets, which is set in three triangles with a fourth hidden triangle in the centre and it really helps us to open all this stuff out and find out so much about what's going on and I'm very pleased that well to be myself a, a, a part of that run of investigation but to find so many other uh, uh, post Stratfordian scholars who are really really looking into this and finding some incredible things uh, as a result of it. 
Okay, um, I think possibly we've come to the end of our time in the questions and answers. If you feel that you've asked a question wasn't answered and you're disappointed that by that, as I said, it will continue in the members forum uh, on the Devere Society website at devereSociety.co.uk. Uh, can I thank Howard, uh, Derek, Hank, uh, and William, and Kevin, uh, and you, Rosemary, uh, for very kindly doing this question and answer? Shall I say mine eye saith true, and that your love taught it this alchemy, to make of monsters and things indigest such cherubims as your sweet self resemble, creating every bad a perfect best, as fast as objects to his beams assemble. Oh, tis the first, tis flattery in my seeing, and my great mind most kingly drinks it up. My eye well knows what with his gust is green, and to his palate doth prepare the cup. If it be poisoned, tis the lesser sin that mine eye loves it, and doth first begin. to swell and the approaching tide will shortly fill the reasonable shores that now lie foul and muddy. Quickly, spirit, thou shalt ere long be free.
maid called Barbary. She was in love, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow, an old thing it was, but it expressed her fortune and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind.
Hey Robin, Jolly Robin, tell me how thy lady does. Sister, we'll know. 
There's fennel for you in columbines. There's rue for you, and here's some for me. We may call it Herb Grace of Sundays. Oh, you must swear your rue is a different. There's a daisy. 
I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. The Bonnie Sweet Robin is all my joy. <laughs>
Is it that says most? Which can say more than this rich praise that you alone are you? In whose confine immured is the store which should example where your equal grew? Leave penury within that pen doth dwell that to his subject lends not some small glory. But he that writes of you if he can tell that you are you, so dignifies his story. Let him but copy what in you is writ, not making worse what nature made so clear. And such a counterpart shall fame his wit, making his style admired everywhere. 
You to your beauteous blessings add a curse, being fond on praise, which makes your praises worse. In 
As you run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies, and Daphne holds the chase. your convenient leisure and you shall know how I speed and the conclusion shall be crowned with your enjoying her. Adieu, you shall have her master book. As at noon does he now rest in her sweet and shady bar came a shepherd and requested in her lap to sleep on but from her look the moon Oh, <laughs> 
protection from his own good purchase scope, who would send the sweet possession of such beautiful hope? A father sight of lingering fight, forgone the joys of pleasant note, the nurse of men who promise more, forgone in all, come to me so. How at last agreed those lovers, she was firm that he was wrong. Tongue can tell what I discovers, joys and sorrow ever saw. Did he relent, or she consent, accept the night, or was she known, left me her name or no? She said, First, a very excellent, good, conceited thing after a wonderful, sweet air with admirable, rich words to it. Oh.
in time to come, if it were filled with your most high deserts. Though yet heaven knows, it is but as a tomb which hides your life and shows not half your parts. If I could write the beauty of your eyes and in fresh numbers number all your graces, the age to come would say, this poet lies. Such heavenly touches ne'er touched earthly faces. So, should my papers, yellowed with their age, be scorned like old men of less truth than time, and your true rights be termed a poet's rage and stretched metre of an antique song? But were some child of yours alive that time, you should live twice in it and in my rhyme. Thank you all for attending this conference. I hope you enjoyed that beautiful concert, so lovelily played by Elizabeth Pallet and Hannah Grove. I hope you've had a happy time, and that if you are not a member of the De Vere Society, you'll consider joining or making a donation to our worthy cause through our website, which is devereSociety.co.uk. Thank you to all our contributors, Richard, Derek, Annabelle, Charles, William, Howard, Harry, Adam, Hank, Rosemary, Elizabeth, and Hannah. And to all those who made this happen from behind the scenes, Yvonne Cheel, who devised the programme, Costa Chard, who coordinated, Paul Middleton, who provided the technical know-how, and Ralph Walker-Smith, who designed the graphics. I hope no one has been left out. Thank you all. Carry on spreading the word and good night. <laughs>